Learn how to use Pandas for data analysis and data science in this full course for beginners. You will learn Pandas by example from Santiago. He is an experienced developer and he also created one of the most popular data analysis courses on the internet. So you are in good hands. Let's get started. Hello, my name is Santiago and this is Pandas by Example, a collaboration between Free Code Camp and Data Wars. I am originally from Argentina, world champions of the 2022 football or soccer World Cup. And why I'm telling you this? Well, as any other Argentinian, I've watched and played football pretty much my entire life. And you know what I have learned? That you don't get better at playing football just by watching games on TV. This seems obvious, right? To become a better footballer, you have to go out and practice. The same applies for data science or any other analytical discipline. Just watching videos doesn't make you an expert. You have to practice and put your skills to a test. That's exactly what we're trying to do at DataWars. DataWars is a platform 100% focused on practicing data science and applying your skills with real-life projects. There are no videos, just projects to resolve with bite-sized activities that you can check at each stage of the process. The best part is that it's entirely free and we'll explain you how to sign up in just a bit. And this is also the reasoning behind this by example series. This video focuses on resolving real projects, brainstorming and discussing the solutions and the pitfalls along the process. We'll encourage you to try to solve the projects by yourself first, even pause the video before we reveal the solutions. We want you to put your skills to a test and challenge yourself. This video covers all the most important aspects of data management with Pandas, including data analysis, data cleaning and data wrangling. Each project focuses on a different topic and the complexity grows from start to finish. We have separated each project as a chapter and you can jump back and forth. As we've mentioned before, we encourage you to pause the video and try to resolve each activity by yourself first. You can find a list of all the projects we are resolving and the instructions to sign up at datawars.io slash freecodecamp. With all that said, let's just get started solving projects right now. In this project, we're going to be practicing our skills dealing with pandas data frames. We're going to be doing some selection, understanding index selection. We're going to be creating a new column and we're going to do some statistical summarization methods. And finally, we're going to do some question answering by creating conditionals. Okay, so like selection based on different conditions or queries that we want to write. So um, this is kind of on the simpler side for this series. We're just getting started with data frames. Again, uh, doing statistical methods, some selection by the index, creating a column, doing some conditionals, and that's it. Um, if you feel comfortable with these topics, just move ahead to other sections of the video. So you, we get a little bit more, gets a little bit more challenging. As usual, I'm going to encourage you to just pause the video before each activity and try to resolve it by yourself. So you, you can gain some of that application of the skills, right? Worst case scenario, you can just resume the video and take a look at the way I resolved it. And by the way, there are going to be different ways of re uh, resolving these things, these activities. So you might even stumble upon something new that you do by yourself and I do something different and that can be a very rich experience. So let's get started. This data frame, the, the data set we're using, is a data set containing a big list of English words and the index is going to be the word itself and we're going to talk about the index in a second. And then we have two columns, chart count or character count and the value of the word. The character count that's easy is just the length of the word, that's it. And the value is computed by adding up all the individual values of each character. And the individual values are just defined in this way. So A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, etc. So in this case is 1 plus 1. Uh, 1 plus 1 plus the value of H, which I don't know where is H, 10, 11, whatever. Uh, actually, we know it is um, 8 because this is 1 plus 1 is 2. Uh, and the value is 10, so H is probably the word, the, the character number 8. And that's it. This is already given, so I have already read the data frame, and we're going to get started with some activities. The important piece about this data frame is that the index 
is the word like the words themselves make the index so whenever we want to access a given word we can just do it by the index and this is why it's so important to understand how indices work in pandas so let's get started right off the bat with the first activity which is how many elements does this data frame have there are multiple ways of answering that the first one is with the info method which is one of the most common ones pretty quickly we go with info and it gives us an understanding of the index it tells us that the index just an index with entries that go from aa and that's it to this word which i don't know what it means and we have a total of 1,000, 1, words. We can also use the shape method. This gives us kind of the shape of the, of the matrix, if you want, in the data frame. And of course, the values are the same. So we're gonna plug this one in and see how it goes. There you go, it worked. Okay, moving forward. What is the value of the word this thing that I'm not going to even pronounce? And this is a very interesting activity because remember, we're going to be doing selection by index. So as the index is the word itself, I can just use the dot lock method. And this should be familiar dot lock that does index selection. So we can just pass whatever value I want for an index using the dot lock method. And that's going to give me the result. In this case, it gives me the, um, the row itself, the entire row. So we did like this row selection, but the result is in a series. So the projection to put it away, the result of row selection, which is kind of horizontal structure, is going to be a vertical structure, which is a series, right? You see the shaping, right? The, 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 the transposing operations like we go from something that is a row to something that is a series and it's not pretty special don't pay too much attention to it it's just to 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 refer to the fact that the row is represented as a series and here we can see that the value of this word is 317 something also very convenient if you're doing selection is that the df.log method and we're gonna increase here the size df.log accepts two parameters, the index selection and then the columns, right? Why is that? Imagine that we have 100 columns. It's going to be very hard to just, you know, browse, scroll to the value we're looking for. We can just pass here what the column we want to use. In this case, we're going to use value right there. And the value is 317. So let's go ahead and try it. And it worked as expected. What is the highest possible value of a word? Um, df at uh, dot, we're gonna use two methods. Let me show you once again, the data frame. What is the highest possible value? We can do df at value and do a max method, right? That's gonna give us the maximum value there. Or we can just do df dot max to, ha to have the max statistical method computed for the whole data frame, right? In this case, we see again that the value is 319. Or something that is pretty common is do df.describe. And this method is just gonna give you describe, there we go. Oh, auto-completed. It's gonna give you summary statistics of all your numeric columns. In this case, we only have two columns and both are numeric, so we're good. And it gives you summary statistics of all the values right there. So for example, the average value, the average char count, you know, the, the minimum value, the maximum value for character count, the maximum value for value, etc. It's gonna give us some summary statistics. So I think we have multiple methods. We're gonna go here with 319 and submit the activity and that worked. Now, the next one, which of the following words have a char count of seven and a value of 87? And this is pretty interesting because in the way we did selection before, and I'm gonna copy this thing right here. We, the way we did it before was just by passing one value of the index. We, wor we worked with just one word. But selection in pandas, the f.lock here, takes potentially a list of index values to retrieve. 
So here, instead of passing just one value, I can pass each one of them. And there's going to be a little bit of uh, an annoying procedure. I'm going to just copy and paste all the words here. You feel free to fast forward. I will not copy this one because this one definitely has more than seven characters. Just going to, you know, quickly uh, see which ones have seven characters. I think this one has more than seven characters, but doesn't matter. Let's add it anyways. And now you can see that with df.log, you can actually pass multiple indices if you want to get multi-selection or just one, you want to select just one individual row. And to answer the activity, uh, which of the following words have a char count of seven and a value of 87? It's glowing right here. We can just put here glowing and submit and that worked. Just a comment as we were doing before, the, the first element, in this case is a list, is the list of indices to select. The second one could potentially be just the column. So here I could say value for them. Oh, I missed a square bracket. And I just get the value for each one of these rows. Of course, in this activity, we needed both the char count and the value. So that's why I didn't do it, but just a clarification. So. What is the highest possible length of a word? We did it before with describe. We're going to do it again. And char count, the maximum one seems to be 28. There you go. Moving on to the next section, which is exploring interesting words. So we did before this activity. There was that the this word that I'm not going to pronounce. Uh, is the only word with a value of 317. Find the only word with a value of 319. And there are multiple ways of solving this one. We could, let's, let's say we do some sorting first. This is not going to be the most effective way, but let's do some sorting. Let me see if I can put everything in the same frame. Um, df at df.sort values by and value, it's going to be, I'm going to see ascending false. In this case, as this word was the one with the highest value, just by sorting, we were able to reach that result. But of course, that is not always the case. What happens if here it, it's asking us for um, for, I don't know, the value of 18. And that is clearly, or even worse, 50. It's clearly in the middle. I have to just, you know, browse the data frame to find the correct answer. In this case, what we need to do is some selection. We need to do df at, I'm going to do the whole syntax and we're going to explain it later, dot lock df at value. It's going to be 319. And this is the first idea of conditional selection in pandas. We have the word. I'm going to just plug it in to see if it worked. And if we have a good activity, there you go. It worked. Now, how does this thing work? Remember that um, whenever I assume you have worked with this before, whenever you have these operations in pandas, um, and if you haven't, check out some other simpler projects we have in the platform that explain this in more detail. The idea is that we are performing this operation that returns a Boolean array, right? So again, refer to the projects in the platform. We have, you know, a very, very thorough step-by-step -step process to explain these topics. But basically, this is creating a Boolean value and it's saying select this word, select this word, or select this word, and indicating if we want to retrieve it or not with a false true value. So in this case, we don't want the AA word. We don't want the AAH word, etc. But the ones that fulfill or match this condition will have a true value here. And this case is a long a Boolean array. It's a 172,000 Boolean element Boolean array. And there's just one true value, which is the one for um, this word. So once this Boolean array is resolved, to put it away in memory, we pass that Boolean array to dot lock method that returns the value. So here is 
to kind of wrap it up with this idea of dot lock, we have three ways of doing dot lock. We can pass just one value as we did before for the index, right? We can pass several values for that match the index, or we can pass a full Boolean array indicating which elements, which rows we want to select by just uh, putting a false or a true value. One tiny comment that's kind of a question we receive all the time is that is this efficient? We could have resolved this thing with just iterating and not using any memory to put it away because at the end of the day, we have to create this Boolean array, which is gonna set in memory. And then we do the selection based on that Boolean array. So the question is, why are we gonna create this intermediate Boolean array if we could just, you know, iterate it, right? I can do something like uh, for row in df if row add value equals 319 print uh, row just to put it away in, in reality I have to also use the index but anyway in this case I'm just doing a more imperative way of resolving this activity and I'm not using any memory I'm just the data frame is a data frame that is, exists in memory I create a, an auxiliary slot just for this particular row and this seems to be more efficient but the reality is that these Boolean arrays are actually very, very tiny. They might look like there are this huge, huge, you know, series, which all these string values, but in reality, these are just ones and zeros. So it's a very small one bit element array, right? And the index is pretty much the same that we have. So uh, just a comment on the side, and I wanna get to technical, but again, the beauty of pandas selections this dot lock works by the index and again we can pass just one value multiple values or a full boolean array all right moving forward what is the most common value um to answer this question we can refer back to i'm going to do value scribe there you go and we can do um different statistical methods right so in this case we have the mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, etc. We also have the median, which is right here, which is the value 103. And there is one that is not showing up here, which is the mode of the um, of the given series or a given array. So we can got, we can we could have an understanding of the statistical method. So we're gonna do something like df at value mode we get that 93 is the most common value. Now, this doesn't tell you much because it just tells you of all the different values we have in our data frame, let's do that. Uh, 93 is the value that shows up the most times and we don't know in which situations because the character count might be different, but there are different characters, so the value is different. But a very common method, something that I use all the time is the df at value and we're going to do value counts method this is a very very helpful i get just the first ones um a very helpful method is going to give you this given value appears 1965 times so 100 as activity said is the second most common value and there are um 100, well, there are 1,921 words that match that value. The value 93 is the most common one, and there are 1,965 words that match that given value right here. Um, we could do something like df.lock, df at the value equals uh, 93. And we can get here, let's get the first 10. All these words get um, are have the same value even though they have different um, different chart counts, right? Because they have different um, characters. Let me do sample here. So we get a random sample of values. So right here we have, for example, ingests have seven characters and has the value is 93. Again, the sum of the characters results in 93. 
but uh, let's do it again. I'm gonna keep that one there. Uh, the testable has 10 characters and has the same value, right? So again, to compute the mode of a of values, you can use the use the mode um, statistical method or for me, most common, um, very useful is the value counts method. Gives you not just the most common value, gives you kind of a ranking of the most common values in a in a column, and also gives you how many samples you can find of that value. All right, so, oh, we haven't done it. Let's see if it passes. 93 is our most common value. There you go, it worked. What is the shortest word with the value 274? So let's resolve that now. Um, DF, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of selection first. So let me align that so we can zoom in. What is the shortest word with the value 274? So first we can start by selecting all the words with a value of 274. There you go. And then what we could do is either sort values um, by char count, and this is gonna be the shortest one, or um, we could have done a little bit of more selection. I think that um, just by doing this method, it works. We could have done something like we get the value, the char count, sorry, here. So we have that um, only the given column, and then we get the minimum value, right? So what's the minimum value? 20. With this thing, we could have also uh, extended our query and do df.log. Um, I'm gonna do that and this and the, the df.log, no, df at char count is equals to 20. That's the one we got before. And this is equals to that. And there we go. We can do a very quick selection we could have done it also in a way that it's dynamic. So we get plug this value here. And this is all the same thing. At the end of the day, I think to just, you know, if we don't have too many elements, sorting the values is an easier way to resolve it. So let's go ahead and do it. There you go. By the way, this is something that we do you know, in production to put in a way like in our day to day jobs all the time. Sometimes you will need to build more dynamic solutions, but sometimes you're just doing some analysis, just exploring data, you know, you can keep it easy, just, you know, with the different methods. You can hear the important piece is applying the right technique for the right problem. All right, moving forward. Next activity, this is interesting. Create a column ratio, which represents the value ratio of a word, which is defined as the value of the word divided by the character count. So let's do that right now. Stop me if you wanna practice this by yourself, but the way to create this ratio is gonna be, let me show you the F first, the head, is gonna be DF at ratio, that's the name that it's asking us, um, the column that it's asking us, is going to be equals to df at um, value divided by df by char count. And now we're gonna, gonna do this thing again and we have a ratio computed right here. The value divided by the char count. Let's check to see if it works. It did work. We are good to keep moving forward. So a few more questions. What is the maximum value of ratio? DF at ratio dot max, 22.5. Um, what word is the one with the highest ratio? And here, multiple ways to solve it. Again, sort values, I think is a good alternative. We're gonna do by ratio, but here, let's do it right here uh, this, in this way. 
By default, our values is sorting in ascending mode. We actually want it flipped. We want to start, you know, with the highest one at the top. So we're going to pass ascending equals false. We're going to pass this order. And now we have that the highest ratio is 22.5. Um, what word is the one with the highest ratio? Um, 22.5, the word is X U. Um, as we know, the highest ratio, we could also have written a query df.lock where df at ratio is equal to the maximum ratio. And that is also X U is the same result. So again, two different ways of resolving the same activity. It's important for you to have all the techniques in your tool belt, then which ones you use, it depends on what problem you're solving. How many words have a ratio of 10? So what we can do here is we can do DF, we could have done, this is not gonna work so well, value counts, to get an idea of the values. And here we have just, this was, this, we were very lucky that 10 is a common enough value that there are 2,600 words with it and we can see it. But if this was not such a common value, the, the, the ratio that we're looking for, it's probably, you know, buried in this sea of different ratios because there are actually 1,333 different ratios. So as, as ratio is a continuum variable, you know, there are multiple individual points. It's usually not convenient to use value counts. Instead, what we want to do is just write a simple query. df.lock, all the rows that have a ratio of 10, right? That's the query we want to build. Gives us a bunch of rows. What we can do is just do a shape and that's going to give us the same number that we have right here. We're going to plug it in here. Let's do a quick, quick stop here, an asterisk to mention the dot query method. So df.lock and all this selection is usually the prefer method because it's the most powerful one. But sometimes you just want to use the query method that is just kind of a shorthand. You can write it in plain English. It's kind of Python based. And the query method is just works in this way. We can say ratio equals 10. And it's relatively simple. Um, you can use it whenever you have like simple conditions. There you go. Here's for you to compare. I personally, myself, I usually prefer this method, but that's because I'm just very used to it. And I like thinking in terms of Boolean arrays and combining Boolean arrays and all that. Uh, up to you if you want to use query, the one that suits you better. Moving forward, what is the maximum value of all the words with a ratio of 10? So we're going to keep, let's keep query here. This is the results. And what we can do here is we can sort the values. Let me put in context again the activity. What is the maximum value? Sort the values by value, value, ascending, false. And here we can find what is the maximum value of all the words with a ratio of 10, right? Head. There you go. We had, um, what is the maximum value? 240, it seems. Um, we could have also done here, uh, actually for this particular solution, I think this method is going to be better. We can do that and we're going to do value. Just get the max. We should get the same result, 240. And that's the same answer here. The beauty of sort values is that sometimes you see like the data. In this case, you have to trust it, which is fine. We have an analytical resolution. We we can trust it. But in this way, like you can trust it. Like the ratio is 10, char count is 24, the value is 20, 240. It's it's usually a little bit, I don't know. It it leaves you at peace to see that the data is okay. Um let's keep moving forward. Of those words with a value of 216, what is the lowest uh, char count found? 
In this case, we have pretty much the same thing. Uh, we're gonna do here. DF, let's do query now. And we're gonna do, of those words with the value is 260, so value is 260. What is the lowest chart count found? So first, this thing is gonna give you all the words with the value 260. And now we can sort values by chart count. And that's gonna give us um, what is the lowest chart count found is 17. So here we're gonna find 17. There you go. And the last activity we're gonna be done based on the previous task, what word is it? This is the word and we are good to go. One important, one minimum comment um, about the query method, and we're just gonna wrap it up with this particular project, is that when your, when your um, columns have um, spaces, you need to surround them in backticks. So let's get, let's invent a new activity just by ourselves here very quickly. I'm gonna use describe. There you go. I'm gonna say, um, let's say I'm just writing this on the fly. Um, find all the words with char count greater than the mean or the average char count. Char count, yeah. Character count. All right, so this activity we're like just making up on the fly. How can we, first we can compute and let's say we have, um, we're gonna mean char counts, it's gonna be count, it's gonna be dot mean, and we're gonna print it. I'm gonna show you how to write the query using this variable. We're gonna do df.query um, where char count, and this is not gonna work is greater than nine, right? So this is not gonna work because there are spaces, you have to surround them with backticks. That's the first thing you wanna work. The second thing is if you wanna reference this variable in here, if I do this, that's not gonna work either. Just gonna blow up. Because by default, anything that is a name within this query is gonna reference a column. So if you wanna reference an external variable, what you have to do is pass here the ampersand uh, symbol. In this case, it's gonna say, give me all the values in which this column, surrounded by backticks, so respect the, the white space, is greater than this thing, and this thing is referencing an external variable. So go out, to put it away, to the global scope, or local, whatever, and find this value, plug it in, and run the query. And here is what we can do right there. So again, the query method is convenient, I personally, myself, I prefer to use the dot block method. I like to combine it with column selection. I like to think in terms of Boolean arrays, but it's perfectly fine to use query. Just remember these uh, tricks, right? That uh, sometimes you're gonna need to use backticks for columns with white spaces, and you can reference external variables with the add symbol. That is it with data frames. Let's keep moving forward and solving more projects, applying those data science skills. In this project, we're gonna practice how to filter data, sort it, do some selection, some querying, all very useful data analysis techniques. The data that we're gonna be working with is a data set containing Pokemon information, including their type, their uh, stats, some total attack, defense, and all that, their generation, and their legendary status. So let's go ahead and just read the data to get started. And we're gonna start working with activities one by one. As usual, just pause if you wanna resolve it by yourself, and then you're gonna hear me with the explanation. What I'm gonna try doing in this project or for this project is giving you all the different possibilities we can think of. So solutions with dot lock, solutions with um, iLock if that applies, and also solutions with the dot query method. The first thing that you have in this notebook is a little bit of an information in terms of distribution of the Pokemons we have. So for example, these are all the type one Pokemons. And you also we also have some analysis of, for example, the stats. So for example, total, 
We see that there are a few very powerful Pokemons, um, both in terms of a histogram and a box plot. So all these visualizations are usually pretty useful, right? When you are starting your data analysis with a new data set, you just do a quick visualization of how your data is distributed in terms of, for example, categorical variables, how they are assigned, or also the ranges distribution of some numeric variables, like in this case, the total one, so to see we, we can see the most powerful Pokemons. Uh, in this case, there are legendary status, we can also consider a categorical variable. Done that, let's get started with the activities one by one. So how many Pokemons exist with an attack a value greater than 150, right? So let's take a look at the data first. That's what we're dealing with. And we're going to focus how many Pokemon exist with an attack value of greater than 150. So let's get started. Pause if you want. And we're going to do df.lock, df at attack greater than 150, right? Um, that's going to give us the full list of Pokemons with that attack. And we can kind of see that there weren't like too many with that value already with the Fox plot. With the uh, query itself, we can get a real sense of how many values we have. In this case, we have just three. We could also do something like shape to get it. But again, we can clearly see that there are only three samples that match that given condition. We can also do the query method. So I can do df.query uh, where um, attack is greater than 150 and we get the same results. So let's try it out. See, there you go. It worked correctly. Moving forward, select all the Pokemons with a speed of 10 or less. So in this case, we need to create a sub data frame. So it says right here, store your, your results in slow Pokemon's DF. So in this case, is a speed of 10 or less. So that's that's going to be pretty, pretty slow. It's right below here. We have probably 10. It's going to be a pretty small amount of Pokemon. So let's take a look first how many fulfill that condition. Speed DF at... Oh, mistype. Speed is... Uh, 10 or less, so this is less or equals than 10. And we have only a handful, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and we can, of course, assign that to this variable to have a final check with activity. Let's do it on the side in parallel. There you go, it worked. And of course, using dot query, it's query speed is less or equals than 10. From now on, I will try to stick to the dot lock method is the one that I prefer um, instead of using query, but you know, you can use either. I prefer to work with Boolean arrays. Remember this expression, it's gonna be just a Boolean expression, right? So how many of these values are, the, the values are true are basically that the values that match the given condition. This is pretty useful if we want to count the values. And this is something that I could have done in the previous one, which I didn't realize to show him before. Basically, if I did something like this dot sum, I'm going to get the same result, right? How many values in this full array? So array is an at is it, attack is an array, let's say a series, a collection that has integers. And then we ask, give me an array a Boolean array of all the ones that match this condition, in this case, greater than 150. So it's going to be false, 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 false. And of course, we're going to have three in this huge array that are true. So in this case, as I told you in the previous project that we did with English words, if the array, in this case, it seems that there are just, you know, strings saying false and true in reality, this is a Boolean array. So in reality, these are all ones and zeros, very efficient, very compact array, ones and zeros. We can sum that and we have the final result. In this case, we can count, we can sum, right, all the ones. We have just three ones and that gives us the answer to the previous question as well. All right, moving forward. Um, how many, let's go here, how many Pokemons have a SP death? 
value, special defense, value of 25 or less. Um, special ability defense. So we're going to do df.log. How many Pokemons have a special defense value of 25 or less? We're going to do df at sp.def less or equals than 25 because again it's value of 25 or less and now we have a bunch so now we can use the technique that we did before that is just this dot sum I'm gonna crazy sides here a bit and we have 17 as a result i could have done the same thing here shape and i get pretty much this table has 17 rows of course this is a little bit more compact, let's say, easier. So let's try it out, 17, and see if it works. There you go. It worked. We're good to go and keep moving progress, making progress. So select all the legendary Pokemons. This is a pretty interesting one. We have to store the result. Select only Pokemons that are legendary and store the result in the variable legendary dot, legendary df. So that's going to be df.log, df at legendary. But let's take a look first, using the info method, let's take a look at the legendary column. The legendary column itself is a Boolean column, a Boolean series, given by its type. So that means that it is itself a Boolean array with true and false values. We could ask df at legendary how many legendary Pokemons we have in this data set and that's just the sum of the legendary status and that's it because this is a boolean array so remember if we did df at attack for example greater than 150 and we ha had this huge boolean array falls through falls through and then we selected the ones that had a true value we can pretty much do the same thing here and what i'm going to do is we could say something like this thing is true right so give me all the legendary pokemons uh, what did I do wrong? Um, false kind of, oh, boolean index. Df uh, is equals, there you go, my bad. Is equals to true, but the reality is that this column itself is a boolean array. So let's just get rid of the true and we say select all the and the Pokemons that are legendary, just that, just pass the mask, the Boolean mask, and perform the selection. If we wanted, let's say we wanted to get all the Pokemons that are not legendary, the not the non-legendary Pokemons, we can of course do something like false. We're gonna get how many we have. But the reality is we can just invert the array. We had false, false, true, false. Right, that was our original array. We can do inversion of this thing, negate it with a, this operator. That's going to give us true, true, false, true. This is false. So what I can do is I can just do the negation here and I get the same result. So sorry, I got a little bit sidetracked. What we want to get is all the Pokemons that are of type legendary. And to do that, we're going to assign that to this variable and we're gonna get the head first five rows there you go all legendary and let's check if the activity passes this is why it's so important to understand the column types of your data because sometimes you know the selections or the boolean arrays you're going to be working with are not the same depending on the type of the data you you have okay Moving forward, find the outlier. So we have this distribution of Pokemons and we have to find this particular one, the one that has a defense value that is pretty big and also an attack value that it's pretty low, right? So this Pokemon has a ton of defense but a very low attack. Of course, we could do something like DF a defense uh, dot sort. Let's 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 do let's do the F at hand. Show the whole thing. Then we're gonna do df dot sort values by defense and show the first few. Um, 
by default, the sorting method is in ascending mode. So we are starting in this way. We're, we're going in this direction. We want to invert that. We're going to do ascending equals false. So now we have the strongest ones here. And here we have the one that has a defense of 230 and an attack, right, of, in this case, uh, attack here of 10. This pretty much gives us the, the answer right away. Let's actually try it out. Let's see if this is the one. This is the Pokemon that the activity requests, at least for this particular value. It is that passed. But I want to make a comment here is that you can you can actually sort by multiple um, by multiple criteria. We could also say something that sort by defense first and then as a second criteria, sort by attack. There you go. And then for defense, we want it to be in descending mode. So ascending is false. But for attack, we want it to be in ascending mode. Again, the result is the same because the data, it's pretty clear who is this um, outlier right here. But again, the understanding is we can sort by multiple criteria. What's going to happen is that the sorting starts here. And then we're going to sort by attack in the other direction. We can combine as many as we want of this criteria right here. Um, all right, moving forward, more activities. Now we're going to get into advanced selection with some Boolean conditions. How many Firefly Pokemons are there? So we want type 1 equals, equals fire and type 2 equals flying. So what we're going to do is we're going to do df.lock. And here, again, pause if you want, we're going to do a little bit of Boolean operators. The first condition is going to be df at uh, type 1 is equals to fire, right? And the second condition, and how many do we have? The second condition is that type 2 has to be flying. Flying. There you go. But what we want is the combination of both. Type 1 fire and type 2 flying. The way to do that is to combine them with an operator, an ampersand operator. So I'm going to break it into different lines here. And I'm going to put the operator right here so you see the conditions. How many far flying Pokemons are there? Seems like we only have five. Let's try the result first, and then we're going to explore a little bit more the, the data frame resulting. And as you can see, I haven't even looked at a single Pokemon. What I'm doing is just combining conditions and summing boolean arrays so this is a pretty interesting thing because what is happening here is like let's say we had only five pokemons in total right we have um and and we have the first array here is gonna say type is is fire and the second array is gonna be is uh flying right and we had something like true true false true false so this is of type fire type fire not type fire, yes, type fire, not type fire. And then for flying, we had false, true, false, false, false. There you go. So in this case, this is the only flying Pokemon. What happens, and that's why we have like different results. Of course, we had here a bunch of fire, fire Pokemons, and here we have a, couple, a bunch of flying Pokemons. We have true values for the condition. But what happens when you, we use these ampersand is that we do one by one, bit by bit, boolean value by boolean value, we do the operation, the ampersand operation, which is like the and operation in Python. So we do true and false for the first one. So the first one can be true and false. What is the result of true and false? False. And what then we do... The result of true and true. What is the result of true? And let me show you true and false. Is of course false. True and true is true. So we have that. False and false is false. True and false again is false. And we could say this one was true. False and true is false. There you go. So in an and operation, and we have opera operator 1 and operator 2, or operand, operand 1 and operand 2, for this 
expression, for this whole thing, for this whole expression to be true, both OP1 and OP2 must, put it this way, must be true for this operation to be true. Anything else, either OP1 is false or OP2 is false or both are false, anything else, anything else is false. This is just some Boolean arithmetic. Um, Boolean opera operators just, you know, a little bit of that ap apl applies to Python as well. But the interesting thing is that that same operation we're seeing here, a uh, com comparison bit by bit, value by value aligned is what we're doing right here. So we had 47 Pokemon were of type 1 fire and we had 89 Pokemon were of type 2 flying. And then we combined those things using an ampersand, an and operation, and the result was only five Pokemon. So we can we can actually visualize those sample points. We're gonna do dot lock, and we're gonna pass that condition. And these are the only five Pokemon that are of type one fire and type two flying. Okay, because we are using these boolean operators. Okay, moving forward. How many Pokemon? Oh no, no, one thing, one thing. If we wanted to use a query method, we could have rewritten this thing with query. Um, and we're going to do, remember that if you have white spaces in your column names, you have to surround that with uh, backticks. In this case, it's going to be fire and type 2, type 2 equals flying. And I made a mistake here. Flying should be a string. There you go. We have the final result. So again, this is this is easier to type. Probably we need to put the backticks in the column that has a white space. And here we can just use Python and we can use a string. You have to make sure you're not you're matching, or uh, on the contrary, not matching um, the strings, the string quotes use, you're using to surround the whole expression. Um, and then we, within the Boolean operators, we use the regular Python ones. We don't use the ampersand. We use just the and. When we are using the dot lock form, we must use the Boolean operators are and, or, and not. And if we're doing something here, uh, let me see if I can do not. Yes, we can do a not right here as well. Okay, now moving forward. Um, activity number seven. How many poison Pokemon are across both types? So as you can see right here, um, the type of a Pokemon is a Pokemon has two types. Let's say it has a strong type and a and a secondary type. The type poison can be applied to either the primary type or the secondary one because I can actually show you that to you. Type 1 counts. We have that there are poison. 28 Pokemon that have poison in type 1 and type 2. There are, where is it? Not 31 Pokemon that have poison as secondary type. So we want to basically say or find how many poisonous Pokemon are there in general, right? How many poisonous Pokemon we can find in either type. So the expression, and let's start now with a query method. So you can visualize it first. So it's going to be type 1 equals poison or type 2 equals poison. And there you go. Um, how many do we have here? Let's Let's copy this thing and do a shape to get the final result. How many? 28, it seems. Wrong answer. Um, we can check that in a second. I can try using the dot lock. Oh, oh no, 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 wait, wait, wait. It's just a typo here. 59, let's try 59. There you go, it worked, so it was just a typo. Um, 
but let's now think about it in terms of the dot lock method. The way it works is pretty much the same thing we did before. Df of type one equals equals uh, poison, right? This is going to give us a boolean array, and we can combine that boolean array, which pretty much is the same expression, which is um, type two points. But here, what we want to do is an or operation, and the way it works is let's say we have let's see if I didn't delete. There we go, our previous arrays. We're going to use them again here, nowhere, here. So let's say we have poison, poison type one and type two. The way it's going to work now is as this is an or expression, we care for any of the samples. So if this Pokemon is poisoned here or here, doesn't doesn't matter. We want to retain that object. So if it's true here or here, we want to still make the whole thing a true operation. That's the result of doing true or false, for example, or doing false or true, right? As we did before, and I can let me delete this thing and go back to our previous notes. We said that if we have these two operations, that it's OP1, operand 1, and operand 2, and I'm still in the end. Sorry for the back and forth, but let's start again. Let's pick up where we were before with the end operator. This thing is going to be true only if both operands are true. So OP1 and OP2 must be true, and this is and operation. OP1 and OP2 must be true for this whole thing to be true. Any other case, everything is false. We can do a very similar reasoning with the OR operation. So OP1 or OP2 must be false, both of them, for this thing to be false. Anything else is true. And this is, you can just flip things and that just works. That's that's the idea between Boolean algebra. You can just flip things, true with false. In this case, true or false, or false or true, true or true, all these things will be true. The only way to get a false result back is by both these things being false. And going again to our logic here, we say true or false is true, and true and true is true, and let's do that, we aligned. False and false is false, right? So these two are false. So this was fire flying, so it's not po poison. In this case, it was, po it was poison rock. I'm just making up types. It was, uh, for example, f uh, flying poison, right? So that is also true, so true and true. So. What we're doing here with dot lock, we are generating the, bool the first boolean array and combining it with the second boolean array with the or operation. And again, conceptually speaking, it works in this way. The result of this whole thing, if we wrap it in parentheses and do a sum, we're going to get the same value out. Remember, these are just boolean arrays. Okay, let's keep moving forward. What a uh, Pokemon of type 1 ice has the strongest defense. So we have to find, and you're going to see that I usually start my activities doing df.head is because I need to take a look at the structure of my data. I'm going to do df.lock uh, type 1, type 1, uh, sorry, df at type 1 equals ice. I'm going to start in this way. So these are all the Pokemon that have type 1 eyes. Now I can keep going by doing something like give me the one here. We can do um, and the defense dot max. So the maximum defense of, um, of type 1 eyes Pokemon is 184. 
I could extend this one by saying, give me the Pokemons that are of type 1 Ice and, and here I'm going to use an and operation because I want both things to be true, and DF at uh, defense is the maximum that I found before, 184. And if you let me, I'm going to put everything together and I could do that. And it's going to give me just one Pokemon, right? So far, so good. Let's put it in here. See if it works. It worked. That was the correct answer. But now, let me show you something a little bit easier. In these cases, we're looking for D1, like the most powerful, or the most powerful, like if we, ha if we have several, but we're looking for a maximum value. What we could have done is just sort values here. We're going to sort by defense. And we're going to sort in descending order. We want, let me show you the standard one. It's going to show you the, uh, the least powerful, like the weakest Pokemon first. That's because this is sorted by defense, but in ascending mode. But what I do is sort in descending mode. To do that, we're going to do ascending equals false. And now we get the most powerful, the same result as before, which is of type ice, we have the the most powerful one that we can see right here. So this is a more of a visualization. You know, I'm doing some analysis with my own eyes so I can just, you know, get the first value here. It's not so programmatic. This is a little bit more programmatic. I could automate this thing and I can do something like, um, for example, I lock zero, one. And I have just the name of the first Pokemon, the name. This is a little bit more programmatic. But again, it's pretty much the same thing as far as, as, as we're, what we're doing serves the same purpose. Okay, keep moving forward. What's the most common type of legendary Pokemons? What is the most common type of legendary Pokemons? What is the most common type? One from legendary Pokemon. So what we can do is let's first lock all the Pokemons that are legendary. And we did this before. So this is going to give us all the legendary Pokemons. And now what we can do is do type 1. This gives us the whole thing. And now we can do just value counts. And we can get that Psychic is the most common type of Pokemons. And let's do that there. See if it works. There you go. You can combine this thing. Kind bar. There you go. To do a little bit of a visualization. But anyway, the result is correct. The important thing here in terms of filtering and all that is that we filter by the legendary status with just the boolean array. And then we pass the type 1 column to get only that column. And then we got a summarization using value counts. Okay, what's the most powerful Pokemon from the first three generations? of type water. So we need to find the F that head as usual. So we take a look at the structure of our data. Find the Pokemons, the most powerful Pokemon by total. So we want to find the total being the, the powerful representation here from the first three generations that is of type water. So let's start step by step with different with different uh, conditions. Uh, to find, to filter types of uh, Pokemons that are type water, that's simple. We're going to do df.lock, df at uh, type 1 equals water. Uh, there you go. But now we have to combine it with the expression that is from any of the first three generations. How many generations do we have? Uh, generation... We're going to do now value counts. We're going to get that there are, um, we can actually, I think, let me see, let me see the, let me ask here, what's the syntax of the value counts, value counts method? Because what I want to do is, not sort these values, we can visualize it in a quick 
var chart to put it in a way. Um, valley counts is the same. How can I? What parameters does it accept? I'm closer to find the documentation of pandas than asking the AI here. There you go. Um, ah, sort false. This is the, method, the, the one that I was looking for. So let's do sort false. There you go. And now I'm going to do plot kind bar. There you go. So these are the generations we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, this is a little bit, this is not useful for the exercise in reality. I just, you know, wanted to, for you to take a look at the generations. Basically what it's asking us to do is uh, the first three generations are going to be generation one, two, and three. Continue with our exercise. How can we get the documents of the first three generations? The way to do that is going to be DF. We could do something like generation. Let me actually type it outside. We can do something like generation equals one uh, or uh, or two or three. And we wrap this whole thing in parentheses, dot sum, there we go. But the reality is that it's a much easier method, which is df at generation dot is in. So we're going to pass here a collection, one, two, or three. We're going to get the same result. So it's basically the same expression as before. This value right here can take any of these forms, and that is good for us. Um, that is the same as doing uh, this full OR. So putting everything together, what we're going to do is let me zoom here, and we're going to break this into several lines. We're going to do type 1 is water, and the generation is 1 to 3. There you go. And I already forgot what the question was answering. What was the most powerful Pokemon by total? Here we're going to sort values by total. And as usual, let me show you what it returns. It returns in a ascending mode. We actually want to do it in descending mode. So we're going to do sort values by... Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. We already did sort values. We're going to do ascending false, and we're going to get Kyogre, Kyogre, my, my, my English is bad, and on top of Pokemon's worse, um, is the most po powerful Pokemon by far um, in terms of total. So we're going to pass the value and see if it works. And we're going to do a quick summary. The first one is this idea of work just as usual, combining um, things with the Boolean array or sorting values to get answer the interesting part is we're using this is in operator, right? That lets you pass uh, several values, and it's basically a, a simple way to write an or statement. So let's say we want to get all the Pokemon that are of type uh, type one, either fire or water. We can say is in, and we can do here fire or water. So any Pokemon that are fire or water. It's basically this volume has to be in this subset. Okay, moving forward. What's the most powerful dragon from the last two generations? This is getting interesting. So find the most powerful by total that is of type dragon, either type 1 or type 2, so either type, from the last two generations and enter its name below. So it has to be a dragon either in type 1 and type 2, and from the last two generations. Last two generations. We saw before the last the generations are, I already deleted it, basically generation value counts. There you go. Is uh, 5 and 6 are the last two generations. We're going to write the whole thing now. Uh, we're going to do... We're going to break it in lines. I want to say df at type 1 is dragon. Um, 
or the F at type 2 is dragon and the F at uh, the F at generation dot is in and here we have the uh, last two generations, so it's five or six. And here, a quick note, we are, I'm using here a set. You can pass a tuple, a list, whatever. I just pass an inline set because the most correct way of doing it um, in terms of performance, I don't think it affects enough, but it's just the correct way of doing it. But anyway, in terms of solving the activity, let's go ahead and the way we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to just run this thing. We have to find the most powerful Pokemon in this in this set of being type 1 dragon, type 2 dragon, and this generation 5 or 6. But you're going to find something interesting. So I'm going to show you these results first. I'm going to see what it, we get. Type, um, it's type 1 dragon, type 2 dragon. That is good. So let me show you the data. Type 1 dragon, type 2 dragon. So the first condition seems to be matching. But what you're going to immediately see is that the generation is incorrect. We get Pokemon from generation 1, 3, 4. And that is because we're combining the conditions that it's either or this thing or and this thing. So the operators in the way they work is that it did the operator of this thing that works and then it did the operation of these two things. But that is not what we're looking for. The way we want it to work is to perform these two first. It's either this, either one of these and this one in here. So to do so, what we need is to surround these two operations with parentheses. So it's like the order of the operations here is important. It's first perform this thing. It's either type 1 dragon or type 2 dragon. And we want it to be generation 6 or 5. I don't know if this syntax worked. There you go. It worked. Um, and now we can see that it's dragon in type 1, dragon in type 2. And the generation is only 5 and 6. So this is the expression that we want to get. Now, the only thing we need to do is sort values by total ascending false. And we get that this Pokemon is the most powerful one. Type 1 Dragon, Type 2 Electric, that doesn't matter. And it's Generation 5. So let's try the answer right there. And it worked. Okay, moving forward, and this is important. We we don't. I don't think we have another activity in this project that has like the precedence, the importance of the precedence or the order of operators. But it's an important concept. Um, so just you know, remember, parentheses don't hurt. It's cheap to put parentheses. So if you have these complex expressions, just make sure you're surrounding the ones that you want to run first with parentheses. You can indent. You can do all sort of things as long as, you know, it makes it look better for you. Could have used something like that. So is this thing and this thing, you know, actually parentheses are not necessary here. Anyway, just keep in mind the precedence of the operations is important. All right, select the most powerful fire type Pokemons. So here we're going to say select all the Pokemons that have an attack value above 100, above, and type 1 equals to fire. And we're going to do df.log. We can actually do a query now. We're going to do... Oh, by the way, we can solve this one with a query method first. So, sorry, let's go back to the previous one. If you're pausing and resuming, you're hating me in this moment. Basically, we're going to say, um, we need parentheses here. So, type 1 equals dragon. Um... Or type one two equals dragon. And oh, we can't do the in here. We can, we can do the in. So we can do 
generation in five or six. And we get, oh, we have to sort the values. And we have the same result. Let me break this into multiple lines. It's difficult to read. But anyway, what you can see here is we are producing pretty much the same expression and the order of operations is important. Type 1 dragon or type 2 dragon, that's the first thing. And generation is in 5 or 6. Um, let's see if it doesn't break when we got this the wrong results. Here, when we remove the parentheses, you can see that our Pokemon's of generation 3, 1. So this is clearly not working. Have to go back and put the parentheses for the order. So sorry. Now let's move forward to the other one, which was select all the Pokemon with attack greater than 100 and type 1 equals fire. We're going to use a query. We're going to do uh, attack is greater than 100 because it says above and type 1 um, equals fire. There you go. We're going to run that thing and we're going to assign it to our variable. Visualize it. Let's see if it works. It worked. We are correct. Next one. Select all water type, flying type, Pokemons. So select all these Pokemons that have type 1 for water and type 2 flying. We're going to do pretty much the same thing as here. We're going to do vf.query. Uh, We're going to do type 1 water and type 2 flying and let's see the data we get back water flying for both types and let's check the activity there you go and finally well not finally there are two three more but select specific columns of legendary pokemon of type fire okay so this is interesting pause now if you want to solve it yourself it says perform a selection in your data frame of all legendary pokemon that are of generation one type one type that are of type 1 fire, sorry, but select only the columns name, attack, and generation. So we're going to do the f.lock we're going to use, and there's going to be a good reason, that are um, df at type 1 equals fire and df at legendary. That's the first result. So type one fire and legendary. I switched the order here. But we don't want to get all the columns. We want to do just a selection. We say we only want the columns. And here we're going to say name, attack, and generation. And let me break this, these two modes. So we get it. And we get the regular right df.lock accepts conditions for index columns, right? So here we have, and let's actually do more parentheses. We don't need them, but let's do more parentheses so it's more clear of what we're trying to do. We need more parentheses. There you go. So this is the condition, and then it comes to columns. Um, and the final result we have right here. So type on fire and legendary, and the columns are name, attack, and generation. Let's give it a try. And that worked as expected as well. Select slow and fast Pokemon. So this is getting interesting now. We're going to see what this visualization shows us. So select slow and fast Pokemon. We're going to get all the Pokemon. Take a look at the distribution of Pokemon speed in the histogram, including the notebook. The red lines separate the slowest bottom 5% and the fastest top 5% Pokemon um, right here. So basically we create a histogram and then we plot two red lines in 0 0.05 and 0 0.95. So it's the 0 0.05 quart quantile, fifth percent, and top 95th percent percentiles. And what we want to do is basically select those Pokemons that are either above this 95% or below the 5%. The two extremes of the distribution, let's say. 
So what we're going to do is df.log. And we have the values, by the way. We can actually take a look at them. We can do here. Let's actually do this thing. We're going to do uh, bottom five is this thing. Top five is 95. There you go. Um, and let's show both top five. There you go. So we know that the cutoff for a very slow Pokemon is a value of 25. The cutoff to be considered a very fast Pokemon is 110. I'm going to use first the dot lock method. We're going to do df at speed is um, less than, because we want it to be uh, select, uh, where, where are we? Is there a uh, the slowest Pokemon and the fastest Pokemon is very slow. It's been below the bottom five or very fast above top 95. So we want it to be this operation. Um, or, and here's another one, very fast. So it's going to be DF at speed is going to be greater than top five. Uh, let's put this whole thing here. Um, slow, fast Pokemon. There you go. This is our table. And let's try it out first to see if it worked. There you go. It works. But there is another way, which is basically using the dot .query method. What we're going to do is df.query, and you know this already, speed. It's going to be less than. And here, to reference an external variable, we've seen this already. We're going to use the, amp the add symbol. So on this thing, we don't need parentheses, or speed is greater than top top five and we need the the there you go and we have the same result 60 rows 13 columns the same result you can trust me but basically the important point here is we are using an external variable and referencing it with the at symbol right to reference something outside of this particular query speed references the column uh, the at this thing references an external variable we have defined before. All right, and I think we have the last one, and this is a very interesting one as well. It says, take a look at the scatter plot correlating defense to attack. What's the name of the Pokemon indicated by the right arrow in the image below? So who's this guy right here? And it's a, a Pokemon that has a a strong defense and a strong attack. So what we can do is sort by both values. So we have like a, this case. First is legendary. And second, it, ha it has a very strong top attack and a very strong defense. So let's take a look. The first thing we're going to do is lock, is filter all the legendary Pokemons. Uh, legendary. And sort values. We're going to sort by doing um, by defense and attack. There you go, by both those criteria. Or actually, we can swap it. Uh, defense. So we take a look at it in a more vertical way. So we're going to sort in this way and then in this way. And of course, we want to do ascending false. And here we have... This Pokemon has an attack of 160, so it's above this line, and a defense of 110, so it's kind of right here. Um, in reality, we're looking this, for this Pokemon that it's very close to 150, okay? So let's keep moving forward. We have this Pokemon that has an attack of 150, so again, right here, it matches and a defense that is 140. So this one looks a lot better. Let's try it out and see if it works. We have our value, and there you go. All correct, all complete. But basically, what we're trying to do here is using this combination of visualizations with the um, analytical power. We're filtering, we're sorting, and we're putting everything together to answer the question. So this was the whole practice about filtering and sorting Pokemons. Um, very interesting one. Again, if you have a chance, try to solve it by yourself 
or there are a few more projects related to filtering and sorting, all yours, let's keep solving more projects. In this project, we're going to be working with a pretty interesting problem, which is the birthday paradox. Um, the birthday paradox uh, comes actually from the birthday problem, which is a more general problem that is basically answering the question, if you put N people in a room, what is the probability that two people share a birthday, right? So, um, for example, I have 70 people in a room. What is the probability that two, any pair of two people within that room, within that room of 70 people, share a birthday? And it's there is a formula to calculate that. The birthday paradox, what it tells you is that it's basically what is the number of people that I need, to, I need to put in a room for that probability to exceed 50%. And the counterintuitive fact that only 23 people are needed for that probability to be above 50%. So again, recap. Only 23 people in a room are needed for the probability of two of any of those people, any pair within that room to share a birthday, right? So only 23 people are needed for that probability to exceed 50%. And this is a pretty counterintuitive fact to be, um, at least to me. The first time I got asked this question, my reasoning was, well, what is the probability, sorry, what is the number of people that I need to be 100% sure that two people are gonna share a birthday? And the answer is of course, 366. There are 365 days in a year. So for me to be 100% sure, probability equals one, that two people share a birthday, I need to put at least 366. That's going to be 100% sure. So when I got asked, well, now what is, how many people do you need for that probability to be 50%? Uh, my first reason, it was like, I don't know, 100, 150, half or 365. You know, it's like, and then when I got the answer and I got to calculate the answer, it's like, obvious it's just well only 23 people are needed for that probability to be 50 percent and we will actually understand why in a second so basically this project deals with the birthday paradox and us calculating the birthday problem the probability of two people sharing a birthday in a in a group of n people um and then we're gonna apply that to NBA teams. And this is going to be a pretty interesting thing because the teams we have here, we can actually run this thing. Um, we can do df at team dot value counts. We're going to have teams that have 27 players, but then we have 24, 22. So we're going to see how many, like if this probability stands, you know, if we're going to have here the probability of two people sharing a birthday in a team of 24 people, the probability is going to be greater than 50%. Are we going to find matches here or here or here, etc.? Right? So that's going to be the problem we're going to deal with. But before we jump to the data, we're going to start with uh, the calculating the probability and understanding the intuition be behind this thing. The way we calculate this probability, and again, is this formula, is what is the probability of two people sharing a birthday in a group of n people so we swap n here we say we put 10 people in a room 20 people in a room 50 people in a room and we get a probability back of uh two of them at least two of them sharing a birthday and the interesting part of this formula is right here is the combinations piece and this is when this this number only 23 is needed to get 50%, it starts to make sense. Once you take a look at this combination uh, formula here, and combinations, just a, week, a quick recap, is if you have um, A, B, C, D, E people, Rob, John, Mary, Susan, Violet, etc., the way you can combine them is basically A with B, A with C, a with D, A with E, um, B with C, B with D, B with E, C with D, C with E, and finally D with E. These are all the combinations you get. So 
pretty quickly, if you start thinking in pairs of people, this number grows pretty quickly. If I put just one more person here, let's say one more person joins the room, I start adding, I will add five more combinations because it's F with A, B, C, D, and, and E. So it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be A and F, now B and F, C and F, and D and F and E and F. So one more person, uh, what did I do wrong here? One more person that I add to the room and this number of combination grows by the previous amount of people in the room, right? I add one more person, G, and I'm gonna do G, F, E, D, C, B, A, right? It's gonna grow by six. I add one more person to grow, grow by seven. It keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. So that's why, I, at least to me, that was what made this problem click and understand that is a very small number of people that we need, only 23, for the probability to exceed 50%. Um, we can actually calculate the combinations piece. So, so let's get rid of this and by F. So F is no longer invited to our party. So we have A, B, C, D, and we can calculate the result of combinations of n taken by 2. And this is a pretty pretty simple you know, formula. It's n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k. n and k in this case is n people or n taken by k. In our k is going to be n taken by 2. But we can very quickly um, hack this formula. It's going to be def, we call it ncr, r, of n taken by k. And the way it works is you can just do math.factorial of n divided. And if you let me, I'm going to do something just here, a shortcut. This is the, the beauty of Python. I can just assign a variable to a function. Um, factorial of n divided factorial of k times factorial of n minus k. And I will return this whole thing. And we have that the combinations of five people, NCR, of five people taken by two is 10. And we said if we add a, a sixth person, this thing is going to grow by five, right? So it should grow by five. And I have now six people, 15. And we said if we add another person right here, this thing is going to grow by all these previous ones. So it's going to be by six more. So we're going to do, if we have seven people, this should grow by six, should be 21. There you go. So we're calculating this thing on the fly. That's the way it works. So now let's get to the activities. And this, in this case, the, um, the project is asking us to calculate the probability, right? When n is uh, equal to 10, and we can actually take a look at, there is a table here, we can kind of cheat, that is the, the value, but we can calculate it ourselves. And to do so, what I'm gonna do is something like, uh, we have one minus uh, 364 divided by 365. And here we're gonna do, we're gonna use our formula, or sorry, our function that we calculated before, that is equal to 10 people taken by two. So n taken by two, in this case, n is gonna be 10. So gonna 10 taken by two, and we're gonna use parentheses here just in case. And our, and our um, probability is 0 0.11614. In the table was 0 0.7. I don't know how they computed it, what rounding they did, but it's pretty much the same value. Let's see if this is okay. It is okay. Um, it's asked us for now equals to 15, but I'm gonna go ahead and it's it's asking us to implement the function. So given number of people, calculate the function so we can do it generically. And the way I'm gonna do it, it's just gonna do return this thing and I have to swap just one parameter that is here, number of people. There you go. And now we're gonna do birthday probability of uh, 15 
0.25 and put here 25, 0 0.25 and it worked as expected. And we can check now the um, birthday probability function all at once and it worked as well. So we're good to go. Um, so again, this was quick recap. The idea is for this project not to be extremely mathy, but it was just a quick recap of the birthday problem. And now we're going to apply that to our data set to see how many people within a team share a birthday, if any, right? It's going to be a pretty interesting one. So the first thing that we're asked to do, I'm going to delete this thing, solution, um, is we need to extract, let me show you again the data frame. We're going to extract the birthday, birthday from the birth date function. So date is the actual date, um, day, month, year. We want to extract only the birthday, right? So for two people to share a birthday, they just need to be month, day. It's like, hey, I my birthday is September 29, yours is September 29. We share a birthday, but potentially it's going to be different years. That doesn't matter. So we need to extract here the month and the day from this data frame. To do so, we can use the uh, strf time function, string format time function. That is actually part of Python. In this case, it's implemented for a tuple. And it's implemented, let me show you this here it's implemented in the column birthday with the dt special accessor don't worry too much about it the only thing we have to do just go ahead and google the syntax to get this thing to get this format um, as expected the way it works is um, this function is going to receive a formatting so for example uh, we can get the year and the day right there we're going to get day and year and here we can put whatever we want we can put an at an sign and hello hello world and it's just going to be a formatting it's going to format this string that's going to replace with special values starting with the percentage symbols and the question now is how can we um get only month and and, and day this is what it's asking us for birthday we can actually go ahead and ask our assistant. We can say, uh, how can we format the column birth date in the format uh, month day? Do we have month day without space? And let's just go ahead and ask the question. I'm going to increase the size here. There you go. And we get pretty much this format. Um, pretty interesting uh, because it's actually the the correct answer. Um, and let's try it out. Gonna copy this thing. We're gonna. There we go. And this is the correct format, so you can see. Um, if you want, you can Google. We can say um, str of time pandas. We're gonna find this method. We can here find Python string format documentation. And here you can validate that percentage D is gonna give you the day with leading zeros, which I can't find, but, but trust me, there you go. Day of the month, zero padded. And then we're gonna use percentage month, which is zero padded month. And then you can get year, you can get year with the four digits, um, you can get uh, day of the week. You can get AM, PM four times. Again, you can do any formatting you want. In this case, we only need the um, month and day. So this is the format that we are looking for. Close this one. And now we're going to assign this value here. And we're going to check to see if it works. There you go. It worked. Now, we know already what we want to answer is how many or which players or how many players within a given team, this is important, share a birthday. So we need to separate all the players within a team and we need to find the ones that 
um, share the given birthday. We could potentially think about this problem in different resolutions, for example, finding duplicates within a team, doing group buy operations, but those are all, at least given the, the, the project we're solving now, things are a little bit more advanced. And basically what I want to communicate with this particular project is that sometimes we can find clever answers, clever solutions that will pretty much give us the same results. And the one we're going to do here is we're going to use combinations, combinatorics to pretty much solve the same problem. And here we have an example. Um, we have the built-in combinations uh, formula. We have something built in. We didn't have to actually write the one we did before, but just for the sake of uh, the example, we did it. And here, the way to think about it, forget for a second about the NBA players. The way to find these people matching is first, we're going to use this combination function. What it does, it puts, it aligns combinations within a given collection. So the same thing we did here with our people, so combinations right here, this thing, so remove F and G, there you go. It's going to put A with B, A with C, A with D, A with E, B with C, etc. It's doing the same thing here. John with Mary, John with Rob, Mary with Rob, we can add someone else, we can add Susan, we can add Violet, and we can add, and then we're going to do... As again, John, Mary, Rob, Susan, Violet, Mary, Rob, Susan, Violet, Rob, Susan, Violet, Susan, Violet. Those are all the combinations. And then we have all the birthdays. So they, let's add two birthdays. Let's add uh, July 20th. And let's add um, September uh, 20th. So we have another repetition. There you go. It's going to do March 5th, September, March. It's going to do the combinations again. And then what we can do is we can put together these things with a little bit of pandas. We can create these separate data frames, aligning these people and aligning these birthdays, and then combining them all together with this simple operation. Oh, and I just realized that I have overridden our original data frame. That doesn't matter. We'll have to read it rate it um and now we have all these combinations of people their birthday and now we can just ask which ones of these people are matching and we have that one and six are matching so one is john and rob because they are march 5th both of them and six is mary and violet because they're both september 20th right and we can apply the same reasoning the same solution for our NBA data. Here, what we're doing is we're not doing any group by operations. We're not doing any algorithmic nested for loops that could potentially work. What we're doing is we're being very smart and using combinations to reshape our data. We're going from, let me do a little bit of a drawing here, if you allow me. We're going to do, we go from a small data frame with uh, one, two, three, four, five people. We're reshaping it. We're creating these long formats with all the different combinations. And now we don't need to algorithmically like iterate this thing over and over and over again. We can just answer data by finding chunks here. How many, which um, combinations here are true? In this case, it's uh, one, no, I'm not good drawing, one and six. What I'm saying again, and we're going to move forward in just one second, is sometimes you need to work smart. You need to understand your data, reshape it, be creative in the way you work with your data to resolve the problem. And this is going to be a lot more scalable than think it algorithmically. Because trust me, when you start working with big pieces of data, these solutions that are more declarative are going to be more scalable than algorithmically. We cannot parallelize an algorithm. We could potentially break this thing. Imagine you're working with millions of records. You can put this thing into different servers and check it in parallel. That could be completely possible. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to 
work now by solving the activities that we are asked in this particular project. So as I told you, I am stepping over this data frame. I'm going to reiterate it again. Where is our data frame? Right here. And we're going to recreate our birth date um, column. There you go. We're going to go straight to the activities. How many pairs of players share a birthday for the Atlanta Hawks? And again, we want to use the same solution as before. To do so, the first thing we have to do is to um, only get the players from the Atlanta Hawks. Because we don't want to compare every player with every player. That's going to be like a huge number, right? So we want to get, uh, we actually have um, the number of players in the Atlanta Hawks going to be, let's put in a, in a, in a variable. It's going to be df.log, df.team equals, and uh, let me copy directly from here. And that's, we have teams df that shape. We have 22 players. So now what we're going to do is pretty much the same thing we did before. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this thing. I'm going to paste right here. I'm going to do, instead of combinations of names was a variable we defined. What I can do is just do team dfs at um, team df at uh, player. Here I'm going to put player one and player two. There you go. And I have the correct results. One interesting comment here, completely on the side. Um, we were QAing this project with someone that resolves the project and makes sure that the quality is good, there are no errors. And this person was finding an error and saying, I have too many. I have too many names, right? Um, and I don't know what's going on. And it was a very imperceptible like, problem that the person was using DF instead of team DF. And I said, like, have, is this possible? I have 150,000 rows. And this is an interesting piece because it's like you have to kind of understand the big range of data you're working with. Like we were, we were working with Atlanta Hawks and we needed to create these combinations of players. And we need to, we have 22 people in Atlanta Hawks. How many combinations of pairs you can create? And this is, it's important to understand, to have a range, a quick ballpark estimation of what data you're working with and what should be the result. Because I honestly don't know if it's 231. But I do know that 100,000 is too much. It's definitely too much, way too much. So this hints is like understanding the data you're working with. This kind of quickly gives you an understanding that there is a mistake in something you did, right? So if you forgot you were filtering by the Atlanta Hawks and you wanted to create pairs of only these 22 players, and instead you created combinations of... 551 players, that number grew by a lot. We actually have our formula, NCR of 551 taken by 2 is the same number, 151,525. And NCR of 22 players, 22 players in the Atlanta Hawks, give us 231 rows. So this makes a little bit more sense. So anyway, just a comment on the side. I meant is like, again, having an understanding of the data we're working with. So let's go back, rerun this thing. Uh, the name's DF, and we have the 231 rows. And we're going to do the same thing for the birthday. Birthday and into birthday here. And this is going to be birthday. And here we're going to do name it birthday one and birthday two. And finally, we're going to put, by the way, they are aligned, 231, 231. We're going to combine them with the same concat operation we did before. I don't want to overstep the name, so I'm going to do check df. 
and I'm going to do names and birthday. And now let's take a look at our data frame. We have the combination of the player and the birthday of each one of the players. And now we can ask the question, how many pairs of players share a birthday for the Atlanta Hawks? What I'm going to do is a uh, birthday one is equals to birthday two. And we're going to sum this whole thing. Seems like there are two players. And then what we're going to do is df dot lock this thing. Uh, no, check the F. There you go. We have these two players. So, um, Team DF, let's see if all the variables are correct because I might have done something wrong here. Quick recheck. Team DF is that. We have birthday, check the F, and we have uh two players uh these are it two pairs let's go ahead and try the answer have two players there wrong answer try it again um let's go ahead and recheck our thing i don't want to i want to make sure i use the rock team and then we have uh the player and the oh this is a very unlucky mistake. It's a very unlucky mistake for sure. What I'm checking right here is birthday and using birthdays and check the dates that we have in this particular point. This is just bad naming on my side. I used the, the old data frame that I use for the sample and the dates are in these formats that is September 20th, whatever. And I just recreated this thing for the entire um, data frame. So my mistake, let's go ahead and delete birthday DF and delete it. And we're going to use this variable name now and try to recheck it. And it seems that we have three now. And effectively, we do have three people. Let's try it out now and see if it works. Now it works. So again, the previous mistake was just using bad variable names. I should have used something like testing, or combinatorics, birthday, or proof, whatever, instead of the real variable names. But we have just fixed it. How many pairs of players share a birthday in the Cleveland Cavaliers? So this is pretty much the same thing we did before. We're going to get out. Change the date. We have 22 people. It's going to be the same probability as in that now. We're going to do that now. And we have only one pair of players that share a birthday. That's going to be June 26th. So we're going to just one pair and that works. And finally, we got asked in the Dallas, Dallas Mavericks, who shares a birthday with JJ Borea? What we're going to do is rerun our code. We have 24 players. What is the probability here? NCR of 24. Uh, NCR 24 taken by 2, and we have 276, 276 combinations. No, we actually want to do the birthday problem. Uh, there we have a 0.53 probability of two people sharing a birthday. Let's actually go ahead and do it. And we have one um, shared birthday, and it is... J.J. Barea and Deron Williams on June 26 again. And that is the final result. So anyway, a few things we saw here. I think it's pretty interesting the, the way we have solved the project without using any algorithmic imperative 
and nested for loop solutions. We used a data-driven approach, thinking about how we can expand this data, kind of a, a map reduce sort of solution that I think scales pretty well. And also I made a few mistakes that I think were um, interesting to see live. Um, and the fact that we're combining these conceptual things, resolving these conceptual challenges, mixing it with real data. We validated that this birthday paradox, you know, we have two or three themes, teams, sorry, we found it for at least three teams right here, um, Atlanta Hawks, Cleveland Cavaliers, and Dallas Mavericks, that there were pairs of people, pairs of players sharing a birthday. So that that is pretty interesting to see something that is statistically proven or the probability is 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 high enough. Now we see how the resolution in the real data in the world in the real world data also applies. So anyway, try to take a look at the project by yourself and try to resolve it by yourself. Um, and let's keep exploring more problems together. For this project, we're going to be combining our data cleaning abilities with our string handling abilities. And these two skills together are extremely powerful when it comes to the process of handling data that is coming from the real world. So, so far we've done a few projects that had a data that was pretty much perfect. We didn't have to do much handling, munging of it, but that is not the real world. Usually when you are collecting data from different sources, you are pulling it from different APIs, databases, or it's even human generated, we're going to be dealing with a lot of strings. And as those are going to be different sources and humans make mistakes, we are going to have differences between these, these data points. And when strings are involved and humans are involved and multiple sources are involved, the result is pretty much a problem. We will always face a little bit of an issue in terms of the data we're working with. So it's very important to have these sharp skills of data cleaning and string handling. That's what we're going to be practicing for this particular project. Let me tell you what we're going to be working with. We have two data sets that they are explained here, but I'm going to just go ahead and show you the, the first few rows of both of them here. There you go. And what you're going to find is that these two data frames or these data sets, they come from different sources, but they have pretty much the same information. That is company names. Um, what changes is that the way these company names was inserted, input, is different. So the companies by themselves, like the strings by themselves, are going to have differences, but the companies are going to be the same. So in this case, we have, uh, for example, from the first data frame, um, this company is pretty much the same thing as this company, but here has it, it has a full name and here it has just, you know, a shorthand. So it's like saying Apple. Apple is not the real name. The real name is Apple Inc. Dot, right? That's the real string. As a human, it's pretty easy for me to understand that this company refers to this same company, right? It's just pretty basic. But the question is now, how can we make that programmatic? How can we build this sort of artificial intelligence to find the companies that are matching so we can match the strengths and, of course, continue with our analysis from these two data sources that are coming from different sources. The answer is no artificial intelligence yet. We're going to use a pretty sim simple heuristic uh, this um, uh, deterministic method, which is the Levenstein distance. Um, it's a simple formula that basically will give you a number based on how different two strengths are. And the good news is that this distance is calculated, this formula is already implemented for us in a package that is already installed in our lab that is called the FOSS. And the FOSS has a couple of very simple methods. We can take a look right here. Um, ratio and partial ratio that will give you kind of a, a similarity or a distance, if you want, between the two, um, the two strengths and U-Pass. In this case, I think it's easier to think about in terms of similarity, right? So these two strings are pretty similar. The only thing that changes uh, is uh, an exclamation mark. 
So the similarity is pretty high, 97. So um, we're going to be using this library to compute this distance. So let's move forward with uh, the first couple of activities. And the first thing that we have to understand is how are we going to match these uh, companies? We could do something like a for loop nested, right? So let's say we have uh, two companies, so A and B, three companies, and C, and we have um, A, A Inc, and B and Brothers, and C. And how can we match, of course, we have more than those. We could actually take a look. We have shape of the F1. We have 266 for the first one and 368 for the second one. But the way we could do it is with kind of a nested for loop. We could do something like for uh, C1 in companies one and for C2 in companies two, right? And we can do uh, something like Distance, let's let's similarity is equals to let's just use some quick um quick zoo code here of C1 and C2. If sim is greater than 90, um and we can store these things. Let's let's make we're gonna make something like companies, similar companies. We're gonna do uh similar companies dot append or I'm going to put C1 and C2. But this algorithmic approach doesn't let us visualize the data and see and do a little bit of an analysis of what, how the data changed, how the data is represented under the hood. We're going to just do this hard cut in 90 without the ability to see if maybe there was an 89 that was fairly good. And don't 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 worry about the number itself because I mean 90, 89, 85. This approach, algorithmic imperative approach, is not extremely. It's not very analytical in 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 from some point of view. It's not easy to see why or how things are working behind the scenes. So an alternative way that we're proposing for this particular project is to create the combinations of the columns and pretty much do the same process, match every company with every company, A with A Inc, B and Bros and C, B with A Inc, B and Bros and C, C with A Inc, B and Bros and C, match every company with every company. And to do that, there is a very simple method, which is the eater tools, uh, dot product method. So. We have imported the eater tools method and we're going to do here. Let me remove this thing. And we're going to do companies one and companies two. These are plurals. I'm going to do eater tools, eater tools dot product of C1, CS1 and CS2. And we need to wrap this thing in a list to visualize it. There you go. And we have pretty much the combinations of everything with everything, which is, again, what we were uh, wanted to do. So now what we can do is we can just pretty much do four. Let's say we use an imperative approach again. We're going to do four C1, C2 in this thing, right? And now we can say pretty much the same thing we were saying, doing before. We can compute the similarity of these two companies. But the result is we went from a nested computational intensive for loop to something that is a declarative, uh, expressive, data-driven approach. In this case, we're generating the data, and now we can do some different things. If we think about this thing in a data frame, we could potentially add a third column that is the similarity. So now we're going to have A, A Inc, and the similarity column. And now we can start doing some analysis. We can filter all the values that have greater similarity. We can do a uh, uh, we can do some plotting for some of the companies that have some, some certain similarity. We can visualize. We can explore. We, we can analyze the data in a more declarative, analytical way than just doing a simple, not simple, but just a more rudimentary, naive iteration or imperative algorithm. 
So let's move forward. Let's get rid of all these things. And we're going to start approaching the first activity, which is basically asking us to build that data frame. Build this data frame that contains the companies of, uh, sorry, the com contains all the companies from CSV1 and the product of CSV2 and also compute the ratio for all of them, right? So we have to put these two things together. The first thing we're going to do um, is we are going to do df at, we're not asked for the ratio right here. This screenshot is incorrect. We're just going to compute, we're going to just compute the product and create the large CSV. So um, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to do df1 at client, at client the values. That's going to be our first list. So remember, we have either tools that product. Here's the syntax collection one, collection two. So we're going to pass for collection one, we're going to pass the row for, for df1. And for collection two, df2, we're going to pass then its firm name dot values. And we can pass this whole thing to a data frame, pd dot data frame. This whole thing, gonna break it into a different row, and we can say column names, columns. It's gonna be CSV one and CSV two. And I have a non-matching parenthesis because I need to close that one. And we have an error with columns. No, firm name values. Name. There you go. Sorry, we have a few mistakes. This is pretty much the, the regular process data analysis uh, or data processing. And now what we see is we have created this huge, let's actually take a look, the F shape. Um, this huge data frame with the same expected rows as the one we have right here, 97,000 rows, which is going to be the result of the product of the F1 shape and the F2 shape. Um, so let's give it a try and see if it passes. There you go. It worked. So, so far, so good. We have our um, product of different company names, so we can do a little bit of matching. Um, now, we are going to apply the range, the Levenstein distance, right, to compute the similarity between the companies. So, of course, the similarity between these two is going to be uh, a lot. The similarity between these two is going to be 100. I mean, sorry, the similarity here is going to be pretty low. The distance is going to be pretty uh, high. The similarity is going to be pretty low. The similarity in these two companies, Adobe for both of them, it's going to be pretty good. So um, we're going to be using this library, uh, fuzz.partial ratio. Partial ratio because the companies have um, white spaces. So it's going to pretty much compute the, the words in different orders. And this might be helpful. Um, all right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to compute the ratio score and we're going to swap to the activity first. So this is the second activity that is asking us to compute the ratio score we have right there. We have the ratio score here of these two companies. And how can we do that? Well, it's pretty simple as we already have the values. So we have DF at CSV. We can just do values here. Values. And we can do something like, um, let's say, score equals uh, fuzz dot partial ratio of C1 and C2 for C1, C2 in DF dot values. It's going to take a little bit of a moment. There you go. We can get like the first 10 scores. And we can now basically apply that to ratio score and take a look at the different ratios. And now we have that Adobe Systems, right, obviously has a 100% similarity, while something like Adobe with Advanced Micro Devices Inc. 
has a lower similarity, right? The only thing similar is probably the ink and the individual characters. All right, so, so far so good. The first part of this process is understanding how we created a declarative, descriptive approach by transforming our data and working with a different foundation. It's like we moved the floor. It's like we started with these two different data frames and now we have just a single one that has this very useful column with the combined ratio of the similarities of each, of each company. So now let's move forward with a few more activities and this is pretty much the whole data analysis process. I'm gonna create a division here and we can get started. Um, how many rows have a ratio a score of 90 of more? And this is gonna be df.lock, df at ratio score greater or equals to 90. And let's take a look at that. I made a mistake. There you go. And we can now check how many we have. And we have 106 companies. There you go. What is the corresponding company in CSV2 to a ecom in CSV1? And this is the one we pretty much saw here at the beginning, this one right here. But let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, there we go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find, we're gonna do uh, df.log, or let's actually use query. So we change things a bit. We're gonna do CSV1 is equals to this one, and ratio score is equals to what? Or greater than what? I'm gonna say, let's say 80 to take a look. There you go. So these two have a 100 ratio score because again, we're using a partial ratio. If we were using a FUS uh, ratio, only ratio, this is gonna be lower. It's actually 30. Um, and that's because there is, in reality, there is a lot of dispersion or distance between these two words. There is no much similarity. Like, again, to the human eye, there's a lot of similarity here because we can f zoom in and just focus on these two words. But if you think about it, it's like this whole thing makes the second string completely different. And that's why we use the partial ratio, partial ratio, which now gives you a 100% score because it's doing the same thing we do with our eyes, which is basically focusing attention in different words, right? And give you the combination of individual words. So anyway, uh, let's try it out. This should work as expected. Um, and basically here is like, we are, um, we are basically trying to understand what's gonna be the kind of value that is gonna make us, right? Decide if a company programmatically speaking, right, in an, in an automated way, if a company name matches another company name, it's like, where's the cutoff value? Um, so CSV1 company, the fifth activity, is Starbucks. What's the corresponding company in CSV2? We're gonna do the same thing, and let's keep the ratio equals to 80. And we have that it's Starbucks, Starbucks Corporation, and let's enter it right here, it worked. But again, the ratio score was 100 and 100. So by doing some analysis, we can start understanding how this, um, this different um, ratios are going to be distributed, something that I'm gonna do in, at the end, just as, as some other activities. So activity number six, is there a matching company in Pinnacle West Capital Comp Corporation? So let's copy this thing once again and put that. And there aren't, like definitely these two are not related. But what we see right here, just because I randomly chose, uh, choose, I'm randomly choosing to use 80 as, as the ratio score to do the cutoff, it's like there are two companies that have nothing to do with Pinnacle West Capital Corporation, but they have a ratio score of 83. And the answer is that because they have, they have the corporation word. 
So we have to be very careful. So I'm going to say here, no. Let's see what's the answer. That worked. Um, and let's move forward. Seven activity. How many matching companies are there for county of LA, blah, blah, blah. And now we're going to put this thing and we're going to keep the ratio equals to 80. So we can take a look and keep understanding what we have. Um, so there is a very clear difference here. We have um, two companies that have a value of 82 and two companies that have one, 100, 195. So above 90. So I'll be tempted to say two here. There are two companies that match the name for County of Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. Um, we should take a look at the full names. So we can do that um, with pd.options, options. Maybe I can ask our AI assistant if I don't remember this, display, max, 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 call with, none. There you go. That was one. Um, if you ever have the dub, you can just ask the assistant, go for it. Don't worry in Googling or asking the AI assistant because that's pretty useful. Um, and here now we can we can take a look at them and we say County of Los Angeles, Deferred Compensation Program, County of Los Angeles, Deferred Compensation Program, and then we have City of Los Angeles. So I would potentially say how many companies seem to be in CSV? And we're going to say two. There you go. They're, they seem to be the same company. Or they're not companies, entities, to put it away. So finally, a activity. Is there a matching company for the Quinn's Health Systems? And what we can do here is run pretty much the same operation. And we find the, Qu the Quinn's Health System just with the apostrophe and the S. So is there a matching? We're going to say yes. And by doing this analysis and we have... I think we're missing one activity. I think I have completed. Oh, let's check this activity. There you go. We have no more activities to complete. All the project passed. But by performing this analysis, so first we did a little bit of data wrangling. We did a little bit of uh, managing to get to the ratio score. And now we're kind of close to start generating the the final CSV, if you want, the final representation of what would be the matching companies. And here, we don't have an activity in this particular one on purpose because there is still a data cleaning process that it's kind of annoying. It could take a little bit of time, but we can start taking a look at, we're going to say, for example, df.log df at ratio score greater than 90, right? And we can take a look at how many companies are matching that um, the, uh, that query. We can go one step further. And when you're doing data cleaning, something very useful to do, at least to me, is to start visualizing your data. So I'm going to do ratio score. And here I'm going to plot kind, kind, hist. And you're going to see that... If a ratio surpasses 90, most of the samples are going to be between 98 and 100. So it'll be interesting to see what companies we have here. Let's actually, um, we, get, we can actually take a look also at a box plot. So we're going to do box. And we have pretty much the same results. Like everything is concentrated in 100. And then we have a few samples in 96, 95, 93. So let's actually take a look at those. And we're going to say df.query. Let's do query now. Where ratio, ratio, score is greater than 90 um, and is less than... 97, let's say. And now we can take a look at what's going on in here. 
And this is, again, this is the data analysis process. So in this case, we have one that seems to be very compelling. This one is pretty much the same thing. Idaho Power Co CO is it's the same as Idaho, Idaho Power Company. Jack in the box in and Jack in the box in with 95. Let's actually sort my bar. Let's sort values by ratio score. And we're going to start with the ones are like less like or more likely. So the Queen's Health System, pretty much the same thing. Jack in the box, pretty much the same thing. County of Los Angeles and Cedar, the, whatever we did before. Sacramento City, Sacramento County. Of course, we have to understand if the city and the county for us are represent the same entity or not, but nevertheless, Idaho Power Company is the same. Safeway Inc. is the same. These two are probably the same, but now we're getting into a little bit of a, even with this one, we're getting into terrain that it's a little bit less clear what's going on here. So I'm not so sure, and this is because I don't know the business we're running, if this um, company or institution is the same as this one right here, potentially, right? But this is where you have to start to ask. So um, in this case, we have Contra Costa County and Sonoma County, and these are this different. Again, I don't know the business, but I'll bet that these two companies are not the same. The same thing with, again, Contra Costa and Marin County. So I bet that these two are definitely not the same. While there is a little bit of a mixed ground between, let's say, this one and this two, in terms of if city and county and city and county and are the same institutions, and then there is no doubt in the last two. So basically, this illustrates the real process of data cleaning, which is, first of all, if we would have done this process before, there was a nested for loop that I deleted. Remember nested for loop, for company one, in companies one, for company two, in company one. And when we do it manually, it's very hard to visualize this um, sort of relationships. So what we did right here was by first reshaping our data and having a clear picture of all the data we had, we were able to create a more descriptive representation. We calculated this ratio score company. We started doing some analysis. We answered some basic questions like, can we find a company here, or there? Can we find this cut of value? We know I just chose 80, but we could have used 75 and see how, how it went. And then um, we took a look at uh, the distribution of the ones that seem to be more likely, and we found like this middle ground that was something like we probably need to go back to whoever is running the business or you know just Google it and start understanding the data that we're dealing with. Because data cleaning at the end of the day might be you you do need a, a ton of domain knowledge. I can't just clean data with my data cleaning techniques without understanding the data that I'm cleaning. I might be a great data scientist, but if I'm cleaning biological data or data from a physics lab, I will have no idea what data I'm working with, right? So um, that's a very, very common common uh, case. You have, you know, you're working with a uh, high tech and you have measurements from instruments and you have something like, I don't know, a column T and you have a value that it's 0 0.0091. And it's like, is this fine or not? And maybe the, physic, the physics guy comes and says, hey, this is completely wrong. You're missing the, the columns. This, the T value should be in the orders of hundreds, not in the orders of, I don't know, very small, right? So I need to understand the data, but to understand the data, to understand the domain, to be able to ask questions, to be able to Google things, to be able to go to the archives of the company, I need to put that in a good representation that allows me to do that. And that's what we're doing with this representation that we have created. So anyway, I have talked a lot so far in these projects because for data cleaning, this is the most important thing is being able to reproduce your experiments, visualize and understand what's going on. Um, take a look at the project, try to resolve by yourself or keep 
working with other capstone projects we have for data cleaning is a, it's a very fun activity pretty much all the time. This project is focused on data cleaning and some data analysis after the data is clean. And it's a very interesting one because the data that we're using, it comes from someone that has scraped, right? Just scraped the HTML out of the Google's Play Store, right? So as, as you might know, whenever you're scraping data, you should be wary of issues in the resulting data because I mean, web pages are not extremely structured. They change a lot. So if you have a scraping job that takes time, because I mean, we have a lot of reviews here. We have like 10,000 apps that were scraped from the app store. That's going to take time. It's not that you can just hit a button and that's going to complete in just a second. It will, it might actually complete in a matter of weeks because Google bans your IP, the one that it's scraping. Of course, this is, I think this is even illegal, right? But someone has done it. Um, and again, it's going to take time to scrape and time equals that things might change. You might duplicate, you might scrape the same app two times. So results might not be ideal to put in a way. So the way we are going to, we're going to, um, uh, go with this is first understanding the data we're dealing with. So that's pretty much the first step. We're going to do df.info. And we're going to kind of brace for impact here. It's like we know that there might be things going on wrong. So the first thing is we have 10,841 entries, the total N number in the index. And then we quickly see that rating has far less value. So there are no, there are no values here. Also, we see something like, for example, reviews right here, which should be numeric and or rating, which see that rating is actually numeric. So this is a good thing, but there are none values. Then we see that something like reviews in this case right here, that is not numeric. It's an object, it's a string. So what's going on in here? That's the question we're asking ourselves. So um, let's actually get started with activities. And it says, which of the col following column or columns have no values? We quickly saw that rating is one of those. We can use the missing NO library. This one right here, missing NO, just a, gives you a quick visualization. And as usual, I like to start my analysis with a quick visualization. When I'm working with, with something, trying to understand the data, a quick uh, histogram box plot, one of these missing values visualization is recommended. The second stage is doing an analytical review of what's going on, etc. So let's do a right here missing NO. We have import we have already installed the app for you or the library and it's already imported here at mess NO. We're gonna do a bar uh, matrix is the most common one um, like this one. I'm gonna do a bar and we're gonna do the whole data frame going to show us that very quickly that rating right, has a good chunk of missing values right there. What else? Well, there are a few here, but it's hard to see with the bar. And one here, 840, one missing value here. And this is, this is hard to read because the bars don't help. So now we can switch to something analytical. And of course, we kind of saw that because we have 1040, uh, 10, sorry, 840, 840, 833, which we know that the full index has 10, 841. Um, but to do so with an analytical way, we can just do is an A. I can do no sum, and that's going to give us, there you go, really quickly, the apps that have, the columns that have no values. And we can sort this, doing sort values, ascending false. There you go. So we have here, we can start answering rating, of course, both versions type and content rating type and content rating. There you go. Both are now um, clean. There you go. There are no values in all of them. So now second, second activity, and this is again, as usual, I encourage you to pause right now, try to solve by yourself, because this is an interesting one. It's a three part activity, remove the invalid values from rating, if any, just set them as NANs. Okay, invalid values, 
And let's take a look at rating. We're gonna do now again, as usual, we can start with a quick visualization uh, at rating dot plots, a kind histogram real quick. And it doesn't look so, so might be okay, but we already see that there are some that are above five, which is of course not a valid rating. And this is my usual comment, you have to understand the data, you have to understand the domain you're working with to do correct data science. Because we know that the rating of an app goes from like zero to five, or actually from one to five. So if you have anything above five or below one, they'll be invalid, right? And it's it's a number, so the, the, the column is okay in terms of the type first check that, for example, we saw already that reviews wasn't. So reviews is an object. This is already here, reviews. They, it seems to be numeric, but then when we check the analytical version with info, we quickly see that it's not parsed as a number. So now it's raising suspicious. We're going to take a look at that later. But here in rating, we understand our data and we know that the top, the, the, the maximum number that a rating can be is five. And this goes above five. So that's clearly invalid. Let's turn this thing into a box plot. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to do vert false. And now we can clearly see that there are a bunch of samples that are completely invalid. Let's take it now to the analytical version. We're going to do rating. We're going to do describe. There we go. And we have maximum value, which is uh, 19. Definitely invalid. All right, let's check it out to say df.log, df.rating uh, greater than 5 and there are a bunch of apps here and we're going to need to claim these apps and the rules set them as NAN. That is it. So here um, we're going to do these apps at rating. We're going to do equals to np.nan. That's it. But then it says fill the null values in rating. So the ones we have just done and the other one because there were like a thousand apps without a rating using the mean so basically what we're going to do here is we're going to do df at rating, rating uh, dot mean. We're going to use this value. I want to say df at rating dot fill. No, no, okay, keep that. Rating dot fill na with this value in place equals true. And now... It's pretty much the same thing. Um, and now it says we can't check that yet because it says clean any other non-numerical non -numerical columns, but just dropping the values. And this is understandable because we, we don't have so many. So we have 10,000 apps in total, like 10,841 apps. But there are apps like occurrences, rows, symbols, but there are only a handful like 13 13 apps that have either a missing version a missing type a content rating so it's not that bad we don't have so many missing apps so we can just get rid of them that's basically what this this activity is saying so we're going to say df dot drop na in place true that's it and that works all right moving on to the next one reviews we already talked about reviews we saw that it's that it was parsed, let me take this right here. It was parsed as an object. Pandas is gonna try to parse any column as a, as a number, okay? This is by definition, it's gonna try to parse the column as a number. If it can't, because the column is not a number, they're string, they're valid characters, it will just default back to object. And that's exactly what happened here. But again, the question is like, where we take a look, df adds ratings, no, reviews, dot head and it, they look numbers that's numbers but it's an object so let's check it out and see what happened we can actually double check doing a two numeric two numeric and we know this is gonna fail because some, somehow i mean pandas was not able to part as a number so there is no way this is gonna work it didn't because basically there are values here that are invalid so somewhere in this list of ten thousand apps there will be 
um, values that are not fully numeric. And let's explore for that. A good way to explore for that is I have my AI assistant here that I asked uh, earlier, for example, what is the syntax of PD to, to numeric when I was just checking this, this project to resolve? And it's telling me that there is this method, which is I can pass an optional attribute, which is errors equals course right here. And that's going to, instead of raising errors with a you know loud red message, it's going to turn the no values as the evaluate values as NANs. So basically that means we can do that. I can create a new column, reviews numeric, that is a result of that. And now I can say df.lock show me the rows in which this row that I have, this column that I have just created is NAN. Because that means that wherever there is a non value, no value, missing value in this new column, that is because there was a number there that wasn't, that pandas couldn't parse. And when it couldn't parse it, it just assigned NAN. And that is basically what is happening right here. Reviews numeric is NAN, NAN, NAN. And we can take a look at the actual reviews and we see that there is this M value here symbolizing for millions. So 2 million, 1 million, 6 or 5 million. We want to turn this thing into numbers. To do so, what we can do is df at, uh, let's say, df.lock, df at uh, reviews dot, um, I could have just done df.lock at 72, oh, here, we can do, I'm not going to do it, but I can just do 178, 1781, and I can just do 2 million, 1 million at reviews, of course, here reviews but of course it's not very scalable um so i'm gonna do something else just just make it automatic to put it away automated like it's gonna be completely generic and this is what we're looking for so basically find me all the reviews that contain contains an m right so these are the invalid values um what are the reviews now there you go. And now what we can do is dot str dot replace. We can do M with nothing. So it's just gonna remove the M. And I'm doing this step by step, by the way. I could have just done it in just one line, but I'm showing you a step by step resolution. And basically we can now turn this thing into numeric. P dot two numeric of this thing. There you go. But we saw there was two million, so we need to multiply it back to one by one million, we have the value. But we want to assign this thing to the reviews column, which is a string type. So it's usually recommended to turn this whole thing back as type str. So we want to make it a string. Because now we can take these values, new reviews, new reviews, and there you go. We have to break into a new line. Break into a new line. There. These new reviews, did it work? Now let me put it right here. New reviews. There. These reviews, basically we want to assign them back again to the, which one? This. No, this, I'm already making a mess of myself. This results. So basically when I get these things, I want to assign it the previous value, right? So we can do, do you want to do the whole thing? Let's do it, everything, just one line, as I promised. We're going to do that. Let's see if it works. So now we can look again for this call, these apps. And let's take a look at the whole row. I can see now that the reviews have been correctly cleaned. But so far, this is just a string, right? We have not, 
which is we have just fixed the three occurrences, which we could have fixed a thousand occurrences because again, this method is pretty generic. It works for pretty much anything. Um, we are going to turn the whole thing now to a number. So we're going to do PDF at reviews. Let's check first to numeric. There you go. It worked. So it didn't raise an, an error. That is good. We now can assign that back to reviews, uncheck our activity, finally, finally, and it worked. Okay, moving forward to the next one. How many duplicated apps are there? And in this case, it's asking us for the total duplicated apps. Let me do a quick recap of the duplicated method. Undo duplicated um, df.log df at duplicated uh, subset up sort sort values by up and then there you go we have all these apps oh here is the occurrence that I'm looking for so basically here eight ball pull um so what it shows by default, if you have, so if you have, for example, Twitter, Twitter, and you have Facebook, Facebook, what this method is going to show you is only this one is duplicated and only this one is duplicated. That happens because, I mean, this is the real one for pandas. The first occurrence is like the real one. The second one is a duplicated one. The same if you have multiple apps so if you have six occurrences or five whatever one two three four five there is one good and four are duplicated that's basically what pandas does by default in this case activity is asking us for the for a different behavior it's saying if there are two occurrences of twitter that should count as two you want to mark like twitter is here is two times duplicated to do so what we need to do is pass a parameter which is keep Sorry, I already made a mess. Keep faults. And somehow, because that should go inside the parentheses. There you go. And now it seems that it's a little bit more interesting in this case because we have every occurrence of the given up. And there is also one more thing to comment here is that Let's say you have this app and you have the number of reviews, which is 19100 for one of them, and the other one is 19100. There you go. So these two rows for pandas are completely duplicated, these two rows. But if you have something like, I don't know, 10,891 and 11002, if you have these two rows right there, if you just do DF, dot duplicated let's do keep false sum by pandas by default is going to tell us there are 18 800 sorry 880 duplicated rows but for this to be counted as duplicated row the whole thing has to be the same so in this example this would be just two these two are duplicated but these two here are completely different rows to me. That's what Panda says, because the values are, in, are different. For us to say, we want to count duplicated apps, we need to do this subset app, right? So let's do that, copy this thing. Now we're going to do there. And now we can count 1979 um, apps, because again, there are some rows that are completely the same. There are some rows that are different, at least in some other column, but the app is the same. Let's actually try to visualize that. I can say, and, and it's, it might take me a while, but, and it's not this thing. There you go. That works. So basically, these are the apps that are duplicated. But there is something different between these rows. So, for example, between these two rows, there is something different. And it's here, the reviews. This one has 666521. This one has 666246. So this one has more, um, more 
reviews on the second one. And again, remember where the data is coming from. It's coming from the scraping process. So there is a chance that this app was scraped two times at two different points in time. And of course, we have a duplicated rows with different data. Anyway, let's answer the activity. How many duplicated apps, but counting them whole, do we have 1979? Let's check if that works. And it goes, it worked. Next activity, drop duplicated apps, keeping only the ones with the greatest number of reviews. And this is a very interesting one. You will sort, the, you will need to sort data frame up and reviews and that will change the order of the data frame. That is fine because what is gonna happen is, and again, you have to understand, let me copy this thing once again, but I'm gonna sort now by app and by uh, reviews. Yeah, this, these lines are extremely short. There you go. So what happens here is that we have, again, this scraping process that potentially scraped two times or more than two times. We have like two, four, six, seven times. Um, and the reasoning, at least what I'm thinking, is that the, the scraping process took like an entire week. And somehow this person scraped the same app multiple times, but there is one important hint, at least to me, which is that the number of reviews in an app is probably always going up, right? It's like you will seldom delete reviews that you've done in an app. I don't know if, you, if that's even possible, potentially is possible. But basically what I'm thinking here is that, and basically what the activity is asking, is that we want to du drop duplicates. And what is the freshest copy of the scraping process? What is the app that get, gets closer to the real number today? And that is potentially the one with the greatest number of reviews, the one with the most reviews. Because again, the reasoning is that this was scraped on Monday, this was scraped on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Because all these apps have a different number of reviews and this one, the one uh, below, right, at the bottom, because we sort by reviews, has potentially the greatest, it's potentially the great, the freshest copy of the app from the scraping process, let's say. So what we have to do here is we can sort this data frame in this way. So we can do, let's keep a copy. This is a good technique. Um, as we're changing the data frame, we're making several modifications. It's a good practice to keep a copy in memory, just in case. You can always go back to this copy. The way I do it, it's just copy. I can put a number, like this is activity number five, so DF, DF copy five, or DF copy before removing, revising, or something like that. And I usually just comment it out immediately, because if I execute this cell again, nothing happens. I don't hurt my copy. So again, if we make a mistake, we can always roll back. We can do DF equals DF copy copy five dot copy. And we have back again the data in this previous stage. But anyway, let's let's keep moving forward with activity. What we want to do is we want to sort the values. So DF that sort values app reviews in place true. And now we're ready to do DF dot drop duplicates drop duplicates, there we go. We're ready to do this thing, but the interesting part is that we need to say subset is by app, and there is a parameter in drop duplicates, which is, which is, I don't know why the documentation is not working. Um, what's the syntax of uh, DF the drop duplicates. Let's quickly, I could also do something. I don't know if you know this trick. I could do help this method right here. Gives you the help that should work with the same as this one right here. But let's wait for the assistance. Try to rid of this. There you go. And there is this parameter, which is keep first. And what keep first does is basically we the, the way panda is gonna gonna work is it's gonna find the duplicates right in this case eight ball pool 
is the app is gonna again one is gonna be marked as good everything else is duplicate but the question is which one is marked as good um, in this case as we sorted the data frame in this order that the one at the bottom is the one with the um, with the greatest number of reviews we want to do a keep last we want to remove all this and want to keep only this copy okay that's again the syntax let me show that to you for a sec right here keep last that's what we want to do so let me close this and we're going to do drop duplicates subsets up i do keep last I do in place true and this is when we're changing the data frame again and we can now check the activity and it didn't work um it's strange and potentially could go back again to the copy and we can try once again and reviews oh Potentially, this activity is checking. That might be it. So let's give the copy what it is. Let me just try this out. DF at reviews numeric. Let me get rid of this column and check the activity once again. There you go. It worked. My mistake. I was not supposed to create a new column, um, which I did. Okay, moving forward. Format the category column. This is an interesting one because let's take a look at category first. Counts. There you go. Um, category, all uppercase. Yes, they're all uppercase. We can see that. And it says that white spaces are actually, we're using underscores for that. We can check that as well. We have to change that. We have to make this thing remove the uppercase, just use white spaces and capitalize it. So autumn vehicles in this format becomes autumn vehicles in this format. So we're going to do this very quickly. And category is equals to the F at category dot str dot replace. And we're going to replace here the underscore with a white space. That's the first replacement we're going to do. Um, the second one is we're going to capitalize the whole thing. And now we're going to check. We can check again this thing. And where is auto vehicles? Auto vehicles. Ideal, it's going to be the same. Let's check it out. And it works as expected. Okay, activity number seven. Clean and convert the installs column to numeric type. You get rid of this. There we go. Clean and convert the installs column to numeric column. Clean and some values that have a plus modifier just remove the string and honor the original number. Okay. So, as usual, we can do something like I don't want to create a new column, so I'm going to do df.lock, df. We're going to do remember the pd.2 numeric of df at installs errors queries, right? All right, is an A. So basically, the apps that cannot, the um, rows that cannot be parsed as a number. We're going to look, use that for a selection. We're going to do a head real quick. And installs 500, 10,000 with a comma separator, 1 million in the plus with a comma separator. So basically what we can do, and I think I could do this whole thing in just one line, would be df at, oh, my bot, my bot, installs at str, to replace, we're going to replace the plus symbol with nothing. We're going to remove it. And we're going to just chain the whole thing, chain the command, and we're going to do comma with nothing. We're going to separate that. And we're going to do pd.2 numeric of this whole thing. There you go. Seems it's not failing, so that means this is working. And finally, we're going to assign this thing to installs. Um, let me see if there is anything else. No, that is perfectly fine. Um, there is no M, right? Because I only I only remove the plus symbol and the comma, and that just transforms to numeric. So I, it seems like I'm, fa I'm safe. Sorry. And we're gonna new assign this to installs. 
and checked activity and it worked. Clean and convert activity number eight. There, there you go. Let me, let me center it. Activity, activity number eight. Clean and convert the size column to numeric, representing bytes. Size columns of type objects. Some values are either M or K. So that's basically megabytes or kilobytes. Let's take a look at our data frame once again. There you go. Sign, size, this is 3.6 megabytes, 9.1 megabytes, 203 kilobytes. We want to turn this thing into a um, into a bytes, it seems, right? We want to turn this thing into bytes. 9, 898 to will become this thing, which is the bytes thing. That is that is good. Some other rules are right, remember so apply the rules as previous task, like the one in the plus. So if we do df pd dot, let's do df dot lock df. I do pd to numeric, and I think there's a good time to keep a copy df copy h df dot copy. There you go. Oh, my bad. Reloading, 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 scanning, 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 scanning. Uh, where were you? Size. We didn't save the notebook. DF copy eight equals DF dot copy, and we're gonna comment that out. And as usual, we're gonna do DF at size dot str dot replace m m with nothing and str dot replace k with nothing we don't want to do that right now because we want to convert this thing to the real numbers but for now if i do pd2 numeric of this thing what happens unable to parse string var 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 varies with device so that is because some other values are completely invalid. There is no way to infer the numeric type from them. So these are uh, to replace with a zero. Okay, so we can start right there. We can say df, df dot lock, df at size equals or as with device dot shape. How many? Oh, okay, a ton. So there are a ton of these sort of apps. Um, and here we want to do that these column size for that condition should be zero. So we're gonna do just we're gonna do um, gonna do zero as type str as usual. Remember that uh, this is not gonna work potentially. PD. This might be fine. Let's let me try it out. If it doesn't work, we have the copy. As usual, we want to keep the values to string. Um, the f at size is is still an object, so that's good. Um, and now it seems that it's working. So there you go. It seems that it's working. The f at the f dot head. Um, we only have to replace r there df dot lock df at size dot str dot contains a comma. Um, cannot mask no containing no. I we we made a mistake. Let me go back again. Copy. This is a good thing. Um, we're gonna basically say pd the series zero that's and i we made a mistake again df copy copy there you go because we might not be able to assign it so what i'm going to do is just more string handling which is the usual way of doing this process which is the f at size equals the f at size dot str dot replace. We're gonna replace this whole thing. 
All right, so it's size for a zero in this way. There you go. And there you go, it worked. So the, the copy is saving us. So there is nothing with a comma that is good. And it seems like we can potentially convert if we fix the issue with the M and the K. Let's go ahead and do it once again. We did it already, this process. Basically, what we're going to do is df.lock. Let's start with the kilobytes. df at size.str.contains the K. K. Lower Lowercase K. Um, really quickly, let me check that. And what we're going to do now is we are going to take these reviews, uh, no, size, that's what we're looking for. And basically, we want to convert this thing. We're going to convert this thing dot str dot uh, replace the k with nothing, right? We want to, there you go. We want to now turn this thing into numeric pd dot to numeric. There you go. But these are kilobytes. And what the activity is asking us is for megabytes. So we're going to do now, uh, sorry, for bytes. These are kilobytes. It's asking us for bytes. We have to multiply this whole thing by 20, 10, 10, 24. And now these are kilobytes. So basically, what we are able to do now is, as usual, we're going to get this thing, those sizes, and we're going to assign them to this thing right here. And this is going to be a long string. And the size of the lines is not great. There you go. So what we're doing is selecting all the rows that have a K, Turning that K to a, removing the K, turning into a number, multiplying it for 1024, because it's going to be bytes, and at the end, as usual, we want to keep that as a string. There you go. Um, we're going to do the same thing now with megabytes. I'm just going to replace M, M, and M, 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 M. And of course, here is 1024 times time 24 for megabytes. I'm going to do that. Finally, PD to numeric of the F at size. It works. Let me show you the size now. So this was three something. Maybe we have a copy here size. There's here 3.6 m so that is 3.6 m this one right here was 3.6 m so 3.6 times 1024 times 1024 is pretty much the same value we have right here so it's good but it's still an object because we we're using strings for everything which is a good thing keep strings keep strings keep working with strings until you're good i'm sure you want to convert that into a number we can do that right now. And let's check the activity. This was a long one. Took a little bit of wrangling. There you go. But finally, we have successfully cleaned it. All right, moving forward. Clean and convert the prize column to numeric. Clean and convert the prize column to numeric. Uh, the value represents with a dollar symbol at prize. Um, dots different than zero. The F dot lock. We're going to check a few prices. Um, that zero is a string. There you go. 1.49. This seems to be good. Let's check if there is one that has a comma or anything like that. Contains a comma. Nothing. So I think we can just... Let's, let's try it out. What if we do pd dot, I mean, criticize here to a numeric of this thing dot replace uh, dollar symbol with nothing, just that. 
Oh no, there are invalid values. Oh, because there is a bunch of price equals free. Mm, well, yeah. Symbol. That is for price. All right, so we can do um, DF at price. We can actually check free. Yeah, there are a bunch that are free. So DF at price equals DF at price dot str dot replace free with a string representing zero. And now it seems to be working. So let's do that. And now let's check the activity. Worked. Finally, paid or free. Now that you have cleared the price column, let's create another one distribution. So distribution equals uh, the column should contain free paid values depending on the app's price. So this is a good one. We could iterate over each price, right? O over the whole data frame of price and just assign one thing or the other. Um, we could use an apply function. We could do something like um, equals, we could do df at price dot apply a lambda with a price p and put um, we can free if p is greater than zero else uh, paid and do that and I could assign that to distribution as it is let me check just as we are doing it but there is no didn't work actually that's a good thing um, because, oh, paid. It's uh, on the other way. It's paid if pray, <laughs> other way is free. I just, and that's why I don't like the apply one. And potentially at this stage, if you're just still doing data cleaning, you might not know this method. But there is another simpler way that is just hacking pandas, which is I will initiate, let's, let's actually see if this works first. Um, distribution, or no, I want to use my method. So distribution is going to be, I'm going to say, distribution is like, everything is going to be free. Like, let's start that way. It's free. We can check the activity. It is not going to work. Not didn't work. But then what we're going to say is df.lock, all the apps that have a price that is greater than zero, right? That, so price. Here, we're going to get the the distribution column, I want to say that to paid that way. Now we can check the activity and that works. So the way, and I'm going to get rid of the apply for a sec. The way this method, which is again, the most convenient is just, if you have a few rules, what you can do is just, you know, start with the one that is going to give you like 70% of the apps are free. And then just work your way, creating other conditions to replace the others. This is a very common technique. All right, now that we have finished with data cleaning, we can just do a quick analysis to answer all these questions. So what company has the most reviews? We can do something like df.sort values by reviews ascending false head. By the way, as usual, this is a good time to stop the video try to resolve it by yourself i will just you know move very quickly over all these activities because this is more analysis that we've done i think it's still interesting but if you can try to resolve it by yourself first and then take a look at the solution i've done so the first thing is the app that has the most reviews this works also as usual df at reviews um, equals df at reviews dot max that is Facebook. Good. Which is the category with the most uploaded apps? And this is df at categories dot value counts. Family is the category, it seems, with the most, there you go, apps. To which category belongs the most expensive up. So we can do df dot sort values as usual um, by price 
uh, sending false dot head and I'm rich Trump edition lifestyle. What's the price? $400 for an app. Okay. I gotta do that. And it works. Again, it's a live type um, application. What's the name of the most expensive game? What's the name of the most expensive game? Um, find the most expensive app in the game category and enter its name. So basically, we're going to do the same thing as here. But we're going to lock here. We're going to do we're gonna do query where the category is game. And the game seems to be find the most expensive app in the game category. The world ends with you, it seems. There you go. Which is the most popular finance app? So basically, we need to first filter by finance. So category is going to be finance. And then it says, with has the most in installs. So we have to uh, sort by installs. And that seems to be in finance, the most popular app, which is kind of obvious. I hadn't thought about that, is Google Play. Google Pay, sorry, that makes total sense and that activity also passes. What team game has the most reviews? So what app from the game category and catalog as teen in content rating? So DF at content rating, the value counts. We haven't looked at all the content ratings yet. Uh, teen, okay, so what I find we want to find the app from category equals game, it seems. Uh, category game and content rating equals teen. That's. And we're going to find the one that has the greatest number of reviews or so the maximum number of reviews and sort values by reviews ascending false. First five. Asphalt 8 Airborne seems to me seems to be the most popular in terms of reviews of all the games that are of content rating team. Let's take a look. Yep, that worked as expected. What paid game has the most reviews? So we have to find a game that, let's say, let's use our distribution column, column that is here paid and has the most reviews. And it's going to be the same thing. Um, distribution paid and it's, it's a game that has the most reviews. Price equals greater than zero by reviews ascending false. Hitman Sniper? No, because we probably need and price greater than zero. What paid up from the game category, category game, has the greatest number of reviews? Huh. <laughs> What if Cash of Clans? Let's let me try this because I found an error. Yeah. So this activity should be what free game has the most reviews. So we have to fix that. Ideally, by the time you're watching this, that has already been fixed. So let's keep moving forward. Finally. How many terabytes we, we can actually report an issue right here for the previous one, report an issue. The activity is asking for uh, paid apps, but the solution is for free apps. There you go. Submitting it, just in case, there you go. Finally, how many terabytes 
were transferred overall for the most popular lifestyle app. And this is a very interesting piece. This app produced the greatest amount of byte transfer. Enter the answer in terabytes as a whole number running down the nearest integer. Example, if you find the total transfer to be 780 point, just enter 780. So the app most popular is going to be df.query. We're going to say, as usual, category equals lifestyle. Yes, no, what's the name? The live style, there you go. Sort values by, um, sort values by, by installs is the one that produced it. So this is the app that was installed the, more, the, the greatest amount of times, like most times. And we're gonna do ascending falls. I do I log zero. All right, I'm gonna show you that first. So Tinder was the app with the most installs. I right, do dot I log zero. So I get this first row. I'm gonna show you app. This is our app. And now we have to do app. So this app wants to install this many times. And the size is this size in bytes, so, right? So that's gonna be app at installs times app at um, size, right? But this is in bytes. We have to divide until we reach terabytes. It's gonna be kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. There you go. So let me show you the previous one. This many bytes, this many terabytes transferred and I think what do we have? We can we can actually do it in the the following. So six, I think it's petabytes. So we can ask assistance just in between. What follows after terabytes? Um so basically this is the answer in terabytes. It's says to just enter the whole number rounding down. So we're going to put just 6484. There you go. And this is still working. You can see if we can answer real quick. I think it's petabytes that follows terabytes, but it's a kind of, well, it broke. Anyway, the greatest, the app that produced the biggest amount of data transferred in that case was Tinder with 6,000 terabytes, which I think is 6.3 petabytes, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, this was a great project. We did a lot. Remember, we started with the whole data craning process, which as usual, data, we had a lot of detective work. We had to find out why some of these columns were incorrectly parsed as objects. So it was suspicious. We started removing things, turning to the manric. As usual, keep try to keep everything. But I think there are two or three very important things that I'm trying to transfer to you here. And the first one is that um, this detective work, you know, trying to turn things to numeric and try to find out where the issues removing things and doing this iterative work. The second one is if you're modifying data frame, always keeping copies. We were able to fix an issue by keeping copy. Um, and then the third one is keeping everything as string until you're safe to turn it back into a number. The same thing is gonna apply if you're turning something to a date. First, you know, keep working as string, string, strings until you're ready to turn it into a number. But anyway, I think this is very interesting process also the same, the whole idea behind where the data is coming from. It was scraped. So we were finding the duplicate data. We were assuming that the app with the most reviews was going to be the app with um, the, was the freshest copy. So doing all these, you know, analysis based on our data is basically a data science process. So if you are comfortable with this, congratulations, because you're, you're pretty, pretty, pretty close in becoming a data scientist. Now for this project, we're going to combine our data wrangling, data cleaning skills to finally perform some data analysis using group by operation. So it's a pretty interesting one. The data 
the we're working with, the data we're going to be analyzing is information about Premier League matches. The Premier League is the top tier, top flight football soccer league in England, potentially in the world. And the data set we have has information about matches from multiple seasons starting 2006-2007 season. Um, and it's a very, very interesting data set because we have the teams that played and the goals they scored and the final result. So, um, anyway, we're going to start one by one with the activities. As usual, I want you to just pause if you want to resolve them by yourself. Um, pause, resume, pause, resume as you see me perform the, the different activities and you can borrow some ideas from my solution. So let's get started. Replace invalid values from the seasons column. And before we can replace invalid values, we have to identify the invalid values. To do so, we're going to we're gonna take a look at the seasons. We're going to do here value counts. There you go. And see that um, there are 2007, 8, 2008, 9, 9, 10, etc. But then we have this question mark here. So this is one of, one of the first examples of an invalid value in a column. In this case, um, it's a string column of here, string column. And the invalid value comes because this is a question mark. And of course, it's not within the format of the season. There is no enforcing in these strings. They're just strings. But we can see very clearly that there is a clear pattern, a format to, that is an integer dash, an integer, and of course, the question mark doesn't match that. So we have to claim those values and replace them with the value unknown season. To do that, what we're going to do is df.lock, pause now if you want, uh, df at um, season equals question mark, the season value, there you go, all these values, we're going to replace them with unknown season. And now they should be removed. Let's check the activity to see if it worked. It works, so we can keep moving forward. Identify invalid values in goal score. This is a pretty interesting one as well, because it deals with a little bit of data cleaning, but conceptually speaking, the, the data cleaning process, like the decision tree that I'm running in my mind is different because to identify invalid values in goals, I'm going to take a look first again at the info method. And you're going to see that both home goals and away goals are integer numbers. So that is, that is correct. Those are supposed to be integers. So how could we have an invalid value here? It would be different if, for example, we see an object here, because that means that pandas found something that cannot be parsed as an integer, so it turned it into a string, right? Um, but in this case, they're all integers, and that's pre pretty much um, valid. Now, what we're going to find is, given that the we have identified the value type, which is an integer, and the column itself is an integer, what is the next process? What is the, same, the next uh, decision we have to make? Well, if the data, in, if the range of potential values is met, right? So... There are a few other projects that deal with some other things, but for example, we have rainfall, you know, that's something that can take a given value. We have, for example, power, electric power in a house, you know, the, the, the valid values are going to be between, I don't know, 0 and 110, 115, but there are valid values for everything, and, and we have a range now as a second step to define the validity of that column. So to do that, what we're going to do is just use a little bit of plotting to aid in the process of identifying these invalid values. We're going to do df at home, home goals and at plots kind. First, we're going to do a histogram. And we can quickly see that there are some values that are invalid because they are below zero. And in a football match, the minimum value, the minimum goal score is zero. We don't see anything weird on the right-hand side. We don't see any stream goal count. If we see something like, for example, 20, 25, 30, that is a little bit more difficult because it's val it's valid in terms of a range, but 
it's an outlier. So is there possibly a Premier League football match in which were 20 goals scored? I mean, it's possible. It's highly unlikely. And that's this the third step. And we have to start digging a little bit more understanding the value. Again, hopefully or thankfully, um, in this case, that doesn't happen. I'm going to turn this into a box plot so we can visualize it. I'm going to sw swap it to be horizontal. I'm going to do vert false. There you go. And we can see pretty much the same thing. Most of the goals are going to be concentrated here. And we have a few samples below zero that are invalid. I'm going to add away goals now to visualize away goals. And we can also see, like this is the, the, the zero line. We can also see that there are a bunch of invalid values right here. Um, interestingly, the away goals are all shifted to the left. That means that home teams tend to score more goals, which makes sense if you watch football or soccer. Um, so we have pretty much understood the invalid, in, like um, the validity of the column. We know it's an integer. We know that it ha has a range because we know the sport. Um, and we have identified that there are values that are outside of that range. So now we have to take a look at them. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to do um, that are less than zero. And we're going to sum that. And we have 34 home goals that are um, invalid and 39 away goals that are invalid. Sometimes people have issues with these sort of thing that I did. If you want to think about it in a different way, we can do something like df.lock at home goals is less than zero. Um, um, mm -mm -mm, or df at away goals is less than zero. We can take a look here at, um, at the different ones. You know, we can start finding how many we have, or actually we could say something like, it's easier if we do something like shape here or some here. We have only 34, but as this is, this, the result of this expression is a data frame. We can do pretty much everything all together. Um, and now to answer home goals in Valley 34, away 39. So that's going to be 34 home goals, 39 away goals and let's check the activity and it worked now moving on with the third activity uh, it's pretty much the same thing we did before we're going to do df dot lock df at home goals that are less than zero we're going to home goals we're going to that thing we're going to replace them all with zeros we're going to do the same thing with away goals and we're going to check the activity and it worked. Identifying claiming valid results in the result column. And this is a very interesting one because we can keep looking at the different data cleaning scenarios or techniques we have to approach. We had one that we had just simple strings and we had to find a pattern. There is a pattern year dash year this year is the year before than this year, right? So there is n dash n plus one, a four digit integer. There was a, a free form pattern here and there was a pretty clear value. It was uh, invalid, it was a question mark. We then jump to a integer, which was the correct value type or the, the correct type of value for goals. But then we had a given range that was available or was valid and of course, there were values that were outside that range, which made it invalid. Finally, we have the one that we're trying to deal with here, which is the result one. And the, the result column is interesting because what we're going to find, uh, value counts, it took a little bit of time. Um, the idea, oh, because it auto-completed. But the idea is that value counts is, let's say, a categorical variable. It's not, let's say, it's it's a categorical variable. The values that we can take 
um, in result are restricted. It's either H for a home victory, A for an away victory, and D for a draw. And that's it. Anything outside of that range is considered invalid. And these are usually the simpler, to put in a way, values to not to claim, but to identify at least. But we can quickly see if a value is outside of this subset of potential possible values. These are the only three possible values. That is different, again, from what we saw before with the seasons, because we have to apply a pattern here. This is just a free-form string. There's a pattern underneath. So we can have any value. We can have, you know, 1950, 1951 for example, something like that. So that's a little bit more difficult. But again, in this case, it's pretty obvious that everything that has a question mark is an invalid result. Now, how can we clean that? Well, we already have the... the we can already calculate this result. The result column is a calculated column because you can just get that by uh, c computing the result yourself. You know, 1-1 one, one is a draw. If the values here and the values here are the same... If there is a number, an, an equal number of goals, that's a, a draw. If the home goals are greater than the away goals, that's a home victory. And if the away victory is greater than the um, home goals, that is going to be an away victory. So how can we fix that? Fairly easy. We can do df.lock, df at, for example, home goals greater than df at away goals, there you go, these should all be, all these results should be, we can do result uh, value counts, all these results should be um, valid, right? So they, they should all be, sorry, um, an H, but we not, not only have this question mark, we also have invalid values because we can calculate the results. So this is why this is a pretty interesting activity. So now what we can do is just here to like step over the value and we know that it's going to be a home victory. And we can do the same thing for pretty much every other possibility. We can say if away goals is greater than home goals, that's going to be an away win. And finally, if let's put here if home goals is equal to away goals, that's going to be a draw. That's pretty much the same thing. And now we can count again, and we have the possible values. Um, let's give it a try, and it works as expected. All right, moving on to the analysis piece. This is when we start doing some interesting analysis with uh, group by activities and all that. So what's the average number of goals per match? And we don't have that value. Goals per match, we don't have it. Uh, but we can easily calculate it on the fly. So home goals, DF at away goals, we have that. Um, and we can, sorry, zoom out. We can here have the average very quickly. And the activity is asking us, calculate the average number and put it with two decimals. That's 2.66, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not saying it, 2.66, and the activity works. Next one, create a new column total goals. So now it's pretty much asking us to create a new column, the FA total goals, by passing this thing. And total goals, there we go. And we can check the activity real quickly and it passed as expected. Now, calculate average goals per season. And we have to sort the values by, by season and we need to sort it in the goals per season variable. So the way it's gonna work is gonna be, let me zoom in. What I do, group by, group by uh, season. And here, we're going to get total goals. We're going to get the mean. There you go. Uh, we need to sort these by the index. That's the season name. So that's going to be sort in val sort index, which gives us the same result just we were lucky enough. 
and we can store that in the goals per season variable. Let's check the activity and see if it passes. There you go, it passed. We are good to keep making progress. What's the biggest goal difference in a match? And this is an interesting one as well. Why? We have two potential results when home won or when away won, right? We have a home victory and away victory, and we have the difference of those two. So we have something like DF at home goals, um, let's say minus DF at away goals, and we can do here something like max, right? We could do the same thing by doing away goals and home goals. And then we have the maximum. So this is the maximum difference in uh, the biggest goal difference for a home win. And this is the biggest goal difference for an away win. We could have used the same value here to do something like max and min. And that's going to be minus six, right? Because in this case, it was an away win, the way side won, and that gives us a negative result. But basically, if I don't care about the symbol, because basically what I care is the magnitude of the value, eight or six, that's the magnitude of the value, then what I could have done is just do, um, it's something like uh, do absolute, there you go. And now we can get the max value. Or to put it in a way, we can just do sort values, ascending false head. We can get the results here. So anyway, we arrived to the same results using different techniques. Basically, the most interesting piece for me, at least here, is for you understanding the absolute method. Because again, it's six or minus six in this case it's the same for us because we're, we care about the magnitude the goal difference we don't care if it was the way team that won or the home team that won right so the the absolute method will give us that magnitude let's try with eight anyways um it was pretty obvious that the it was a home win if you know a little bit about football soccer those those are case Okay, moving forward. What's the team with most away wins? And this is a very interesting one as well. Why? We could start doing something like df.log, df at result is um, away, right? We have all the away team, away uh, victories. Now we can group, group by the away team because Basically, what it's asking us, what's the team with the most away win? So this is an away win. Um, who was the team? It's basically away team. And now we can just uh, add result.size and we can get, oh, we can sort values by, um, by nothing because this is a series ascending false. And let's do just head. And we have that the team with the most away wins is Chelsea. Let's give it a try first. And then I'm going to show you something different, a different way to calculate this thing. There you go, work. There's a different way. And it's actually the solution proposed here. So I'm just going to go ahead and reveal it. Um, and we can I, can, I can just copy and paste this thing so we don't waste so much time. And I can explain it to you right here. Basically, what is happening here is we can group by the way team and when we do this grouping we're gonna have uh the head we're gonna have uh, all the results for an away team so for liverpool we're gonna have um these results and pretty much any other result from liverpool and that's gonna include draws home victories and away victories so basically what we want to do is we want to group, we're going to get this group that is, um, let me get here, lock if at away team is Liverpool, as they say. There you go. So when we group by away team, we can, cre we create, we create like we have, so we have this full data frame 
that has, for example, Liverpool here and Liverpool here and Liverpool here and Liverpool here, and has a, let's do, how can I, there, has a Manchester City, oh, I got green, why? It's Manchester City, Manchester City, Manchester City, and Manchester City. And we can get another football team from the Premier League. We can get here Wolves. Wolves is another team. Wolves, 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 Wolves. What the group by operation is going to do is going to identify, we're going to use black, it's going to identify the valleys are the same and it's going to prepackage them right in this i don't know if you've heard about it but the term is splits apply combine is going to create tiny groups with the different uh, uh samples that meet the grouping criteria so it's going to put all the liverpool all the liverpool matches here it's going to put um all the Manchester City matches here is going to put all the Wolves matches here. And it's going to give you the option now to work with this thing. So now we can do, for example, now get me the, the away goals and do a sum. Or give me the results and give me the size. We can do any operation with these subgroups. And then it will assemble them again in a table. And it's going to say Liverpool, whatever. Manchester City, whatever, Wolves, whatever, or Manchester United, whatever. Again, it's going to combine all these small pieces that it has created. But before we do the operation, we have the chance to run a custom function, and that's the apply one right here. So we can run, we can pass this custom function that is going to be run in each individual group. And what the custom function does is it gets all the rows, so here is going to get a draw, a, an away win, a home win, uh, an away win, etc. And we're going to perform the, the operation that we want, which is counting the ones that are an away win. So we're going to get only the ones that are an away win. We're going to do a sum and we're going to return that value. So here's going to be two and here's going to be, for example, just one. And here's going to be, I don't know, zero. We're going to get just one. Finally, Pandas by itself just takes care of saying Liverpool 2, Manchester City 1, and Wolves. That's too many. Wolves 0. Right? The combination at the end. And that's the way that function works. Let's clear this whole thing. Unrun it. And we get um, pretty much the same results as before. Is um, Chelsea, Manchester United, Arsenal, etc. So the way to think about it is you can filter your data before starting or you can perform like these operations after you have grouped the data with the individual groups that you had before. Okay, that's it. Let's keep moving forward because we have just three more activities to go. What's the team with the most goals scored at home? Um, so this is a pretty interesting one as well. Let me get head. Head, you take the time now to pause the activity and solve it by yourself. I selected Chelsea. I don't know why. It's a mistake. But again, take the chance to pause and select and do it by yourself. Basically, it's asking what's the team with the most goals scored at home. So it's basically the home team. We have to group by. Home team, home team. Uh, we have to count these home goals. So here, we just count home goals. And we need now to get the sum. Um, we're going to get the whole thing. But of course, we need to sort values by ascending false. And we're going to get head. There you go. Um, and we have that Manchester City seems to be the goal with most, the, the team, sorry, with the most home goals scored. So let's try that out. And that is correct. A pretty 
a pretty dangerous team in attack, Manchester City, for sure, especially now. This is outdated, especially now. Okay, uh, second to last. What's the team that received the last, the least amount of goals while playing at home? And this is also a very interesting one, because if I was just naive, I was going to do something like um, VF, the team group by uh, home team. What's the team that received the least amount of goals? And I'm going to say away goals. So it's team playing at home, away goals, dot sum, sort, values, head. There you go. So Charlton Athletic had only received 20 goals, right? But the the reality is that they only play df.lock, df, or no, let's do df at home team equals Charlton. Uh, there, we, there we go, the sum. Um, they only play 19 games at home. So it's interesting because what this activity is asking us is for the ratio of goals received over home games. And I think if you have not paused, I think it's a very, very good moment to pause and try to resolve it by yourself. But anyway, let's just do it. We're going to start first. We're going to keep the same group by operation. But we will try to get two things. We will try to get the total goals they received and the um, total matches they played. So we're going to get, uh, we're gonna get uh, away goals and we're also going to get first, we're going to get just here home team. I'm going to do two different operations. For that, we're going to use the aggregation method and we're going to use a dictionary. We're going to say, for home team, perform the size operation. For away goals, perform the sum operation. Let's take a quick look at what we have. There you go. We're going to sort values by... Um, by... Uh, by... Home team, that's actually no, ascending false. Uh, by home team, I did something wrong here. My bad. Uh, sort values by home team. Why is Oh, because it's both. So let's replace, replace, uh, rename, rename, uh, columns. We're going to call home team, um, total matches, to total games. I'm going to put away goals equals goals received. There you go. Um, let's break this in a couple of lines really quickly and ascending false. There you go. Um, total games. No, because this is total games now. Games. There you go. So Liverpool, Tottenham. So these are the usual suspects, right? The teams that have always uh, played at the top of the Premier League. Um, what we can do now is sort by two things. We can sort by goal, by, sorry, by total games, and we can also sort by goals received. But we want to flip the sorting here. We want to get all the players that, all, sorry, all the teams that played a ton of games, so ascending false, but then we want to get the ones that received few goals. So we're going to be ascending true. And now we're going to get the Manchester United. Um, Manchester United is a team that played the most games with the least goals received. We can, let's say, we can rename this thing. We're going to do something like, um, we're going to call it um, games 
per team games, home games, games per team. I call that um, head. We could do something like um, ratio. What's going to be? It's going to be uh, goals received per match. And we're going to call this thing, we're going to be the result of home games per team at goal received divided by home games per team at total games. And let me break this into multiple lines so it's a little bit more readable. And now we are going to do pretty much the same thing as before. But what we're going to do is value, uh, sort values by goals received per match. Head, I get the same result, just Manchester United with the uh, best ratio in terms of goals received per match. Let's actually try it out because I haven't tried it out. Let's see if it's the team that we're waiting for. That is correct, correct value. Basically, what I'm saying here is that. We tried, we first got, we have for la, the same grouping operation, we computed two different things. Total games, sorry, total goals received. That was away goals because it was the home team. But we also computed how many games they played. So same group by operation. If you allow me a very quick draw, right? We have like the big chunk of teams and then we did like this separation of small small groups for home teams um but then we computed two different things for home team this gave us the size for the away goals this gave us the sum right some some all the away goals and we did these two operations in all the individual chunks to compute the final results um we quickly identify Manchester United as the one uh, meeting the requirement of the activity, but we went one step further to actually compute these goals received per match value. Why is that? Because if we want to make this thing analytical and potentially automated, we need it. We need it in an analytical way. Um, what else? There is, I think, we can take a look. I think there is a, a pretty interesting solution here. No, I thought that we had a solution that had um, everything in a one-liner with a apply operation. It is potentially doable if you want to give it a try. Um, but I think readability matters in this case. And finally, what's the team with most goals score playing as a visitor away from home? And this is going to be pretty much the same thing as before. Group by away team um, and we're going to get the team playing away from home score more goals I'm going to get uh, goals Go. Um, I forgot already the name of the columns it's away goals away goals away goals sorry and what we're going to do is sum, get a preview, and now we're going to do a uh, sort values ascending false, and it seems to be Arsenal. Let's give it a try. And it passed, and we completed our projects. So this was pretty much the the activity we started with a little bit of data cleaning data wrangling pretty interesting because again we had a good variety of different issues with our data we had the issue of um the the invalid seasons which is a string invalid pattern then we moved to the invalid count of goals which is an integer out of range then we cleaned the categorical result variable it was just a potentially just a result uh, categorical, so the results should be in this in this subset. We had a way to clean that, but just calculating something else in the data frame that was a good thing. And then we started with a bunch of group by activities, all very interesting. So 
take a look at yourself if you want to replay it. Um, in other case, we have a bunch of other projects dealing with data wrangling, group by, and all these operations. This is a very interesting project that combines some data wrangling skills, which involves merging data frames, creating new columns, with some data cleaning skills. And it's going to require you to take a look at the data and do some cleaning to make those merge work. And finally, do some analysis, some question answering with group by operations, with transform operations. So it's a very, very interesting project for sure. As usual, I encourage you to pause the video first, try to resolve it by yourself, and then of course take a look at the solutions because maybe I'm choosing a different way of what you're doing and you can see something different. So with all that said, let's just get started. I have the first few rows executed already, as you can see. And let's take a look at the data that we're going to be working with. In this case, we're going to be working with NBA basketball information. And basically, we have the 2017 season stats. That's going to be in this data frame right here, which involves the usual, you know, just information for each player as an aggregate of the whole season. And then we have a player's DF data frame that involves includes the personal information of the player, so their name, their weight, birthday, college, etc. The important piece here is that the player's data frame contains information about all the players in the re register history of the NBA. So that's from like 1950s. Um, the information in the stats in the seasons only from 2017. So we're going to start by doing a merge, but of course going to be an interesting one because we have to merge in a specific way. The first activity, and here again, I encourage you to just pause, involves merging data from the 2017 season with the players, but performing a left showing. So basically, we want to include here in our season's DF data frame, we want to inc include the personal information from the player. We want to bring the data to our existing data frame from this particular season. Okay, so... As you might remember, there are different types of merge to do. We can do an inner, we can do a left or right outer, we can do a full outer. In this case, by performing a left outer join, we're going to be able to contain, to like to keep all the information from this data frame, 2017, and bring only the matches from the player's DF data frame. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, this is your, your opportunity to pause the video. Um, to do a merge, what we're going to do is we're going to start with season 2017 DF and we're going to merge, merge with uh, merge uh, players DF. Um, and we have to first, I'm going to players DF. We're going to do a how left because that's basically what it's asked. And again, the reasoning is that we want to keep all the information on the same thing from 2017 DF. And we're going to pass the columns to merge. So on the left side, we're going to pass the player. And on the right on, we're going to pass the name. It's the same information, but it's two different columns. Um, if you remember, we have the on, uh, on based attributes to refer to individual columns. And we also have the indices, if potentially you're merging per index. In this case, we're just using the regular columns. And we're going to assign all this to data frame. And let's check the activity to see if it passes. We can take a look at the, the DF. Um, this is going to be a long data frame. I can actually show you something like df.head. Uh, and we can do just the first row and do a transpose so we can see all the information right here. So um, we had, let me potentially do a little bit of a drawing if I'm allowed here. We're going to select red. Basically, what we did is uh, we didn't select red. There we go. So basically, we have all the seasons that we're going to make like a long data frame. I'm going to use uh, blue to do the players merge right there. The resulting the resulting merge that we can use another color, let's say here, purple. The resulting merge is going to basically, as it's a left outer join, and this is left, 
What we're doing is we're bringing this data frame to the side here and basically make it match with whatever information we have in between. So if in the season 17, there were, you know, two players were repeated, we could have potentially um, duplicated that data. And that's perfectly fine because if we have the same player here two times because of any reason, because a player played in two different seasons, uh, two different teams in the same season, we actually want to duplicate the, the right hand information in both of them. Because again, what we're doing is we're completing with the personal information of the player. So said that, let's take a look at the whole data that we're where we have, it's it's a, a large data frame, but what's gonna give us the key if the merge was successful? The important piece is the name, because sometimes you're gonna find that some columns are gonna be nullable, like for example, college is nullable, but this doesn't indicate that the merge wasn't successful. This indicates that just college was null, but the name column is not nullable. So that means that if we find A, a value, a row in the DF variable that is null in name, that means that the merge was not successful. So are there any misses in that data frame? And this is the second activity. We can quickly take a look at that by doing DF at name dot is an A. And here we can do, for example, any, any. This is true. We can actually answer that real quick. And the next one is going to ask us how many, well, we can do a sum right there. We can find there are four missing, uh, four missing players, basically, we couldn't match. So there are four people. And I think now it's going to be a little bit more clear once we visualize and there are four, four rows in the seasons data frame that we couldn't match for a valid player, which is strange, right? Because we know that this players DF data frame contains information for all the players in the NBA. So how is it possible we couldn't match four players? Let's actually take a look at those people. And that's um, the fourth activity that we have right here that is extracting names. Before we do so, I just want to show you who are these missing players. So let's take a look at the values in df that are that have a none or a null value in name and those are these four players right here we're gonna take a look in a second at, at these players and see why we had that mismatch so this activity is asking us to basically find those four people it's asking us to put them in a list so what I'm going to do is just going to do that and I'm going to plus here the player and we're going to do values. And finally, I'm going to make here a list. Now player misses contains the list of um, players that are missing. We're going to check the activity and it passed correctly. So this is a very interesting activity and this is the one that I think is the most representative of the data cleaning process in general for any data scientist, data, data analyst, data engineer, which is actually fixing these missing issues, right? And there are sometimes different strategies. Sometimes you can just delete the missing rows because, I mean, if you have millions of rows and there are a few that are null, you can just delete them. Sometimes you can replace them with something else. Sometimes you have to actually fix them. You have to realize like what happened and just fix it. And the way we're going to do it is just doing some detective work. And, and this is just perfectly normal in the whole data engineering, data science, data analysis process, which is just taking a look at your data and trying to understand with domain knowledge. And this is a very important point with domain knowledge, trying to understand what went wrong and domain knowledge is very important because I can, I can, and we can, we will actually perform this, this cleaning. We're going to fix these values, but we need to understand a little bit of what happened with the basketball season. The same thing happens, for example, and I think I have already put this example in another project. If I'm working, for example, in a biology lab or in a physics lab, in a nuclear physics lab, as a data scientist, there are going to be a ton of 
data cleaning tasks that I will just not be able to perform. Not because I don't know the techniques, because I'm very good with pandas, but because I need to understand the domain that I'm working on in order to be able to perform some operations and understand my data. Right, so for example, if you have no idea about basketball and you see, and you see a value for points that is 100,000, maybe that value is good for you. But of course, it's pretty hard to make 100,000 points in a season in the NBA. So by knowing the knowledge, you have just immediately um, placed the value in a, in a given range that of possibilities. So your data cleaning process, it's a lot more, it's, it's easier and it's more precise because you knew the knowledge. So the same thing is going to happen here. And actually, let's take a look at the activity. And it tells us that with confidence, and I already know what the activity says, with confidence, it says that the players are actually in players DF. So there is something wrong with players DF, the, the right hand um, data frame. So we're going to players DF dot head. So there are some, there is something wrong with the names here that somehow didn't match what we had in player in the stats of the 2017 season. And the objective is to modify players DF so they match whatever we had in the um, in the 17, 20, 20, 2017 season. That's that's correct. So let's first identify where these players that are in the 2017 season are not in the players DF. So basically, we can make a quick drawing here and potentially. So we have in 2017 we have um, this this guy, look, uh, and Ba, which is not potentially in the players DF, so in the players DF, um, the activity tells us for sure that it's there. We have to trust that for now. Uh, but these players, like what name does he have? Basically, we have to find this match. To do so, one thing that I can do is just, and this is again a very detective work. Um, there are multiple ways of, to basically find this, but I could do something like, Let's keep it simple. Maybe this player has a middle name and that is part of the whole player's DF, but in the season, that player wasn't listed with that name. So we can just go ahead and do something like player's DF uh, dot lock. And here I can do players, player DF at name dot contains the same Last name. So is there any player in players DF that contains this last name? And we can find the the given the given player. What happened in this case, and we can just take a look at what happened, is that this player either added a new surname or always had the same surname, but in the 2017 season, he was not listed with this surname. So we have seen we are seeing like the first incompatibility, let's say. So we can say that um, in players, players DF, and we're going to do uh, season 2017, this player should be named, should be named, we're going to do that, should be named um, the name in 2017. So we want that that player to be that name. And we can keep working, you know, with this detective work. Um, maybe, you know, what happened, for example, with, maybe you don't know this, but Muhammad Ali was born Cassius Clay, and then he he switched religion, or I don't know how to say this, but basically he, con he converted to um, Islam, and he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. So the same thing can happen to anybody. We can change our names, and that's what happened here as well. So this person potentially goes by a surname. So, for example, Sheldon Mac McClellan, which seems to be the original name. I can just go to Wikipedia. Uh, born Sheldon McClellan. Here, it, here he is, right? So the guy either changed his name or just made it shorter. We don't know. To be honest, we don't care. We have just found another player with a different name. So 
we're going to do that. So we know that um, in in the let's actually do Mac here. No, uh, Sheldon Mac. Where is Sheldon Mac right here? So in players.df, we we have Sheldon Mac, and we want that player in the 2017 season. It's like, well, rewind it. It's like, what was the name, right, in 2017? And that's the name. What? Who else? James Michael. Let's take a look at Michael here, James Michael, and see if there is any changes. There is a new last name. So again, in players, DF, this person is... James Michael McAdoo, and we want this person to be renamed. We are, it's like we are rewinding the names to th 2017. And in at the end, we have a Meta World. And here I'm going to do another trick. Take a look at this. And I'm going to first lower the names, and then I'm going to do uh, Meta. Meta with a double T. There you go. And seems like Meta World was the name in 2017, uh, but now it's something different. So we're going to rewind again, if you allow me the expression, to the old name in 2017. Um, we can store this in names mapping. There you go. So we can keep the names as a reminder. And of course, I'm missing the comments as usual. That's what we do. We want to do. So how are we, we going to do this thing? Well, th the way to do it is just we're going to find a player. In this case, we're going to find a player with the, with the same name. So in this case, let's do it with uh, the, I don't know, first one, first name. So this is the player in player's DF with the full name. We want to rewind that player back to the name in 2017. Um, and we want to take just name, right? Name. And we want to assign that to the name in uh, 2017. So we can change that. There you go. Um, if we do the merge, let's go ahead really quickly. I'm going to zoom out. Let's do the merge once again, really quickly. And let's find the players don't match. Which, as you can see, it's just three because we fixed the first one. So this works. What we can do now is we have four, but we can just automate, quote unquote, this process. Let me reread players because I have modified players. Let's do the merge again. Let's go back to the state where we have these four players missing, including Luke Mba. And now we're going to do this same process, but we're going to automate it. Just we're going to use a for loop so we don't have to type it one, uh, one by one. And to, the way to do that is going to do for old name, or it's actually like a um, new name, let's say, and name 2017. So it's the new name and the name they had in 2017. In names mapping dot items, we're going to find the person. We're going to find the person with a new name, and we're going to replace it with the name. 2017 value and of course I'm missing now a column and there you go we can now try we can check the activity to see if we did everything correctly it seems like it worked we can now perform the same merge again and see how it goes just let's take a look so I copy these cells same merge and we we know what the activity is going to check, but we can borrow this cell and try it again and see if we had any misses. No misses. So this will potentially, there you go. It worked as expected. Okay, remove unnecessary columns. This is just, again, data wrangling, very boring. Just, you know, we have to get rid of a few columns. As I show you, um, the first row, transpose, there are a ton of columns we're not going to be using. So what we can do is just drop these columns. How to drop? The f.drop is the method. Columns, columns to, to drop. 
in place equals true because we want to modify data frame. Now we're going to check the activity and it worked. Rename teams to their formal names. This is a very interesting one because it has a very simple solution, um, but it's usually not expected. I, I see some some very crazy solutions for this sort of activities that involve a renaming. Basically, we have um, the team of the player is a three-letter acronym. We want to resort back to the full name of the team. To do so, what we can do is the replace method. So we can do df at team dot replace, and we can use this mapping that was given for us, team mapping, um, there. And you can, I will just execute this thing. And it didn't work because it's actually team. There you go, TM. So we're replacing one by one these acronyms. Whenever you have OKC, it's going to find here OKC. It's going to replace it with Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, we're going to find, for example, DAL. It's going to look for Dallas. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Basically, where is that? That last second one. So basically, it's going to, it's, it's just a mapping and it replaces one by one. And we can sort this result, right? In the column team, that's going to be it. So we're going to do DM, DF at team, which is the full name. It's going to be this column with a replace mapping performed. And now we can do DF. Let's do DF at player, TM and team. Let's get the first 10 rows. And we're going to find 10 rows. We're going to find a few things. So IND, Indiana Pacers, SAS, San Antonio Spurs, uh, MIN, Minnesota Timberwolves. So this looks okay. We're going to see what happens here with this TOT in a second. Um, but for now, this is good. And let's check the activity to see if we did the correct thing. And there you go. It's working. Convert birthday to a daytime object. So this is another interesting one. Um, the birthday of the player is a string. We're going to convert that to a day, to a to a um, time sum or daytime. It's very simple in pandas, but we're going to do is PD to daytime, and we're going to pass directly the birth date column. That, but of course, this is an immutable operation. It's just returning a new series. What we want to do is just step over whatever value we had before and of course this is a change we cannot undo so easily so in this case we are safe to just over, like step over the previous values if not you can just create a new column you know in this case we're safe we can just re convert the column back to um, daytime we can check the activity and that worked as well so going back again to the previous values that i show you we had let me borrow this thing here um, delete all players from the TOT team. The TOT is for the players. And let's actually, let's do something. Um, DF at, at, let's look for duplicate players. DF.lock, DF at um, player dot duplicated. Um, yes, and we're going to find, we're going to duplicate this. I want to now, here, only these columns keep false. Sort values, this is a long operation, but don't worry, it's pretty simple. Um, sort values by player Ted. There you go. Long operation. Some players in a given season can switch teams, right? Just right in between. There is a there is a transfer window and they can switch teams. So you have the first, the same player, sorry, like this guy right here that play for both Cleveland and Dallas, right? In the same season. He was transferred in the middle of the season. So this data that we have, and we have to understand again the data that we have includes kind of an aggregation column, which is the TOT column for totals. So totals of this person within the whole season is 
so many field goals, so many three-pointers, so many free throws, etc. Just a total an aggregation of the season for this particular player. We need to get rid of that. So I'm going to do that. And Oh, actually, we can use the same. No, we can't use the same um, condition. How are we going to get rid of these, um, of these values? First, let's keep a copy because, I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be breaking things. So we need to keep a copy. We're going to do a DF copy, DF copy. This is a very common technique when you're modifying something. As usual, I encourage you not to modify things, but if you are certain you want to get rid of something, um, you can while you're doing the process of understanding and analysis and all that, you can create a quick copy of your data if it's not large enough to fill the whole memory, of course, because you're literally copying values. So if your data frame takes one gigabyte of memory, you once you duplicate it, now you, you have two gigabytes of memory uh, allocated. So as long as that's possible, you can keep a copy. And I usually do like copy one, two, three, four, five, and... and that's pretty much the data wrangling process. Until you figure things out and you're sure, then you can remove all the copies and of course automate the work. But for now, we keep a copy. If anything goes wrong, let me comment this thing out so we don't accidentally execute it. We have a copy in df underscore copy. Go back to the activity. We have to get rid of the players that have a TOT team. So df.lock, df at team, um, is equals TOT, all these players. We have to get rid of them. How can we get um, rid of them? There are multiple ways. The easiest is probably also with drop. Maybe not the easiest, because the easiest could be to just do something like DF equals, DF equals uh, uh, all the players that, don't have a TOT. And actually, let's try it out. And this should work for both, except I'm doing something wrong. It worked. Um, but let's bring back the old data frame. DF copy, copy. There you go. So we have it as it was before. I'm going to delete the cell so I don't um, accidentally execute it. And there is another way, which is basically we can find all these, all these um, rows, right? So all the rows we want to get rid of, and we can get the indexes. So the index of the rows we want to uh, get rid of. And finally, we can use the drop method. So we want to get rid of these values, and we can do in place true. And let's see if that works as well. Well, I have to reset all the activities, but trust me, that's also going to work. All right. Like we have pretty much the whole process done. We merged the data frame. We found that there were a few mismatches, right? Where the names of the players changed. So we rolled them back to 2017, doing some um, investiga investigation work, some detective work. We brought back to 2017, merged data, get rid of the columns, created readable names. Um, do a little bit more cleaning, removing TOT and all that. And now we're going to actually start with the analysis. So this is going to be very interesting. So um, what's the team with the most players in the league? So we have, again, so we have um, information about all these players. They work at all these um, players in the 2017 season. And of course, we know that some players switch teams, right? So how many, uh, what team had the most players within a season? Either if they went back and forth, they changed a lot, a lot. We want to answer how many, which was the team with the most players in a given season. That's pretty simple because we can just do a value counts. Uh, counts, and let's do head. And it's going to tell us that the New Orleans Pelicans was the team with the most players to 27 in general register players. And that's correct. So what's the team with the lowest field goals? Um, let's take a look at the data again so you understand what we're trying to do here. For each player, for each row, so each row is a player in the 2017 season. 
we have merged that with our personal information, which we don't need in this activity. But basically, we have field goals that the player scored in that given season. So we want to aggregate all the field goals of a given team, of all their players, and find the one with the lowest value for that. To do so, we're going to we're gonna group by team, team, and we're going to find the field goal column, and we're going to sum that column. Of course, this is a mess, so by, basically we're going to do sort values by, sort of values by nothing, because it's just a series, and it's going to be ascending. We can actually do a head method here. I want to that so it doesn't switch. And we find that Dallas Mavericks was the team that scored the least to put in away field goals in the 2017 season by just computing the aggregation of all its players' stats. Let's answer it. And that worked as correct. What is the team with the best field goal percentage? And this is a very interesting one because field goal percentage is defined as field goals divided by field goals attempt. That is data we actually have. Let me show you again the values. So we have, we have field goals, 134, over 341 attempts. So it's a little bit less than 50%, right? You, th you tried 341 times to score and you only made 134. So you made, you made 134 divided by 341. Your accuracy to put it away was 0.39 or 39%. So that's the column that we want to compute. That's the value we want, uh, com we want to compute. But we want to compute this by team. So we have to aggregate all the field goals and all the field goal attempts from a team and then find that given um, percentage. So we can start by doing pretty much the same thing we did before. It's going to be DF bro group by team. And here we're going to compute two values. We're going to compute field goals and field goal attempts. And we're going to do some of these two. And... This method doesn't exist because I mistyped mistyped it. Group by there you go. We gotta find this thing. So we can we can store this this data frame in a partial variable saying uh, field goals per team and field goal field goal per team. We're gonna previsualize it and now we can compute a new column which is gonna be. Uh, it's going to be field goal percentage, which is equals to field goal per team of FG divided FGA. And now what we can do is sort values by uh, field goal percentage head. And we're going to find that um, with the best. So we need to do ascending, ascending false. So the best field goal percentage is Golden State Warriors. Um, let's try the activity first. Let's find 2017 season NBA. Um, who was the champion? Um, playoffs, Western champions, finals, champions, Golden State Warriors. So it's not... Uh, it's it's not a triviality that the the player with the team with the best with the best um, percentage won the championship. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the one with the worst or you know the 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 lowest, which it's not us, but just for the sake of um, of curiosity, we can find the Memphis Grizzlies, Dallas Mavericks. Those were teams with the least accuracy, to put it in a way. Okay, so what's the difference between the best and worst 3P shooters by position? It is known that shooting guards are the best 3P throwers, 3-pointer throwers, by efficacy or accuracy. The question is, 
what's the difference in accuracy with the worst 3P throwers, always considering by position. You note, use the position from POS column. So we're gonna group by position now, and we're gonna compute both three pointers and three pointers attempts. I'm gonna sum all this. And this is pretty much the same thing we did with the previous one, but in this case, we're doing it by position. Let's store that in a variable. So we're gonna say position, three pointer accuracy. We're gonna store that. And now we can create the new column. We know it's a three pointer percentage, let's call it. It's gonna be three pointer divided by three PA, the attempts. And now we can do position three P accuracy. Now let's sort values um, by three P percentage ascending false. The best position shooting guards as expected. Again, this is just domain knowledge in basketball. The shooting guards are usually the ones shooting better, have with a better accuracy. Um, but it's telling that, that what we actually need to find is what's the difference in accuracy between shooting guards and the worst position, the worst position in the data frame, which we found was the PF power forward position, right? So what's the difference in accuracy? Well, we could do something like this minus that. It's going to give us the percentage. Or we can do something like um, dots at uh, 3p percentage dot max minus the one in min. And now we have pretty much the same value without hard coding. The difference is 0 0.024. So in percentage terms, that's going to be 2.4%. That's basically this value right here. Tiny difference, right? It's like from the best position to the worst position, and it's not a huge difference, but of course, with so many attempts, it actually adds up potentially in the league. All right, so this is a very interesting activity. I seriously encourage you to just pause here and try to resolve number 15 by yourself. It's a very interesting one. It might involve a ton of Googling uh, from you because, I mean, it's not trivial. So just, you know, this is your, use your chance to go ahead and pause the activity, try to solve it, pause the video, sorry, try to solve it by yourself. And I'll give you one second, then we're gonna resume and I'm gonna solve it live right here so you can see how I approached the problem. All right, let's take a stab at it. The activity is asking us to find the best scorer per team. Right, so we want to basically generate this table that it's the name of the player, the team, position, and the total points. Right, so or not best scorers in terms of you know just amount of score points in their team. So basically, um, we're gonna do something like, for example, df dot log at df at team is um, Oklahoma, and we're gonna get. Um, we're going to get uh, points.max. So basically, the max score points in Oklahoma is this amount. And now we're going to find we're gonna find the player by saying um, this and the f at uh, PTS equals that value, a number. And we found that that was Russell Westbrook. Um, we can pretty much put everything in just a one-liner. So we're gonna do, I'm gonna copy this thing here. And I first find the max points in team, max point in teams. Um, I'm gonna, team is gonna be uh, df at tm dot, I don't remember the, we're gonna do Cleveland. Oh, which one? No, we were gonna do Boston. How is Boston? It's probably B O S. B 
POS, is it? Just try it out. Boston POS, there we go. So we're going to try BOS, Boston. And we're going to do here team. Team. I'm going to find that the team is team. And this is max points. It's corporate team. And Saia is the best scorer of Boston. So I want you to understand the problem. This is not the solution we're going to use because, I mean, it involves a ton of manual work per team. We could potentially just iterate, you know, get all the teams. We, we, I can actually show that to you. So we can do something like for um, team in here. Uh, dot unique. Unique. Um, we're going to do that. So we're going to replace here team. We're going to replace here team. Team, um, print, um, we're going to get here two things. We're going to get player, we're going to get uh, team, team, there you go. We're going to get uh, dot values, we're going to get player, team, sorry for my variable names. We're going to do print, um, and we actually can get points as well. PTS, uh, PTS, my variable names are terrible. We're going to use, we're going to say P for team with PTS. I did something wrong. Pierre, player team, df.log. Uh, not enough values to unpack. We're going to do print this thing, break. Uh, mm. Potentially, what if I do this? Okay, I'm doing something definitely wrong here which I can understand. But basically what I want to say is that we can potentially do this manually, right? So let's let's just print this thing. Let's print, uh, print this thing. Um, so Russell Westbrook for Oklahoma with this amount of uh, points. Harrison Burns for Dallas Mavericks with this amount of, of points. Um, let's see, Houston... Again, it's like we can solve it manually. So Denver Nuggets, Denver Nuggets, Nikola Jokic, Nikola Jokic for Denver Nuggets. We could potentially solve it manually, but the solution that I want to show you, and it took me some time, the solution I want to show you involves a group by operation, to put it in a way. I'm sorry, because I'm drawing you lately. Um, I'm going to show you a drawing signifying or, or trying to explain the solution that I'm going to use. So basically, we have a our full data frame. So we're going to use black as a data frame. There you go. There is actually a way that I can make this thing a whiteboard. There you go. So we're going to do, this is our data frame. And our data frame contains information about different players. And let's say that we have red for Oklahoma. We have, oh no, let's actually do red for Chicago, of course. We're gonna use uh, we're gonna use um, blue for Oklahoma, and we're gonna use green, green for uh, Boston. I need a darker green. Green for Boston. Um, and the way it's going to work is we're going to have these players that are just intertwined in the whole data frame, right? So uh, there you go. And let's say that right here, this is the best shooter or the best shooter in the given team. We're going to have the same thing for... For Chicago, we're going to have this player and that player and that player and that player, and there's going to be the best score in the, in, in the, in the team. And then we're going to have 
this player from Oklahoma and this player, this player, and that player from Oklahoma, this is going to be the best. Let's actually put it, put that player here. That's going to be the best from each team. So that's basically what we did in the previous solution. We filter, we said in the previous solution, the manual one, we've created an intermediate data frame that only contain uh, players from a given team, Oklahoma in this case. We then found the best quarter was this value, or actually this value right here. And we made a second filtering in which we said, find the player in that team with that amount of points. So now we have a single player. We want to, this is of course a different solution. What we want to do now, or let's separate it. What I do now is using a group by sort of way operation. We want the, we want pandas to focus on different groups of players. So for example, all the blue players, all the green players, all the red players, and perform an operation in a group by, group by fashion, but we want it to the result expanding back to the whole group. So we want it to just do, that's pretty similar. We're gonna focus on the blue players from Oklahoma. We're gonna do, create the group by operation, the, the split piece, find something. In this case, we're gonna find the maximum in points. So it's gonna be, for example, these maximum points. But instead of what we did before, which is all manual, we want it to go back and replicate this value. We're gonna call this value V. This value V, very important. We want it to replicate it back to all the members of the group. So we want this value to be applied here and here, etc. So we want it, we want it to be, it's gonna be V, 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 and V. And the same thing for any other group that we have. So for Chicago now, we're gonna do another data frame. It's black. We're gonna do another data frame. And we're gonna do player, 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 player. That's all gonna be done automatically by pandas. Find the given value we want. In this case, it's V again, and just replicate that value V, 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 V here. And of course, the value we want to find is the maximum of PTS. So the column PTS, when I compute the maximum value, and then each player is going to have their score. So I don't know, 900 points, or 300 points, whatever. And next to it, there's going to be a new value that's going to be the top of that group, given the group by operation here is going to say, I don't know, a ton of points, 1500. Right, so we want um, each player, this is gonna be 300, and next to it, it's gonna be 1500. And this is gonna be 30 point, player didn't even play, and this is gonna be 1500, right? And of course, this one is gonna be 1500 in the, in the points and 1500 in the values. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just find the top player or the player with the top points per per team. All right, let's get rid of that and finally resolve the task, which is relatively simple. I mean, there was a huge explanation, but trust me, it's simple. The way we're going to do it is we're going to group by team. Um, if I show you the drawing again, it's like we want to group by team, we want to perform this operation here and this operation here for each team. We're going to group by team, but we're going to get a PTS, the column one to compute. But here we're going to apply the operation transform and pass the value max. And that's going to give us a value. And that's basically what I told you before for each team, for each group, for each individual. So it found, it found, it first broke the players into different groups based on their team. It uh, found the value we were looking for, PTS max. It uh, assigned the value to each one. It found the value, put the value next to each one of these, and reassemble the same data frame. And now we're going to have this uh, value once again. So 
let's hide that and we're going to do df at uh, best score per team is going to be that thing. We're going to assign it. We can call it, this is our V value. Of course, I want to use a better variable name. And now we're going to look at, let's say, df at team is uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. Oklahoma City, and we're going to find only uh, player, and we're going to find um, team, if you want to repeat it, on PTS, values by PTS ascending false first rows. And here, you have that for, oh, oh of course, my, I'm, I'm forgetting the most important column we computed. There. We're going to find that all the players in Oklahoma City are now have now assigned this new column, which is best score per team, which is equals to the maximum value of PTS from their group. So this is a very, very interesting functionality from Pandas, the transform method. Basically, it's like group, a group by operation. So all your data, group by operation, split, compute, apply, and then reassemble back the whole thing. Don't end up with different groups. So before all the operations was like OKC, Chicago, Boston, and a result. In this case, goes back again to the previous shape of the data so we can basically create these transform data frames um, to compare it, an individual with third group. So this is what we have. We can compare that with Boston now. For example, we can do the same thing for Chicago. I'm just, I'm showing you. So in Boston, the best score was uh, almost 2200. In Chicago, it was uh, 1800. And you can basically see that each player has a PTS value. And then, um, of course, compared to the best score in the team. Finally, how what we need to do, and I'm going back again to what the activity is asking, is finding the best score per team. So that's basically finding all the players which have a PTS equals to best score per team. So that's going to be df.block, df at PTS is equals to df at best score per team. And we need to get the values player, team, position, and PTS, of course. Um, let's do that real quick. It's not the same thing. It doesn't look like the same thing because if we look at the description, it says that it should be sorted by PTS in descending mode. So now we're going to do sort values. Let's break this thing before it starts showing that annoying scroll. Sort values by PTS ascending false first few rows. Russell Westbrook, James Harden. So we have the same results, it seems. We finally need to store this thing in a variable. Let's print the whole thing. And you can see that now the table looks pretty much the same way as before. Even Fournier looks pretty much the same way. Let's check the activity just as a note on the side at this point because we did a pretty long development and that worked as expected. Okay, we have the final activity cleaning the data frame, the notebook a little bit. Which team has the youngest squad by average player age? And this is a very interesting activity because there are two forms of solving it. Um, the first one is going to involve, let me show you first how we we actually computed birth date as a daytime before. So this is from the player's DF, we turn into a, a birthday. This is very easily solved by doing, um, and I'm just giving you the answer straight away. Um, DF dot uh, group by group by birth uh, team, T 
team at birthday dot mean and of course I made another typo here probe by and let's just sort the values um there you go um and the interesting piece here i don't know if you are noticing this right away is that this operation that seems like a very mathematical operation of computing the average or the mean was actually applied to a daytime object right so that is that is pretty interesting because daytimes um are not numbers per se they're just points in time but basically what pandas is doing is finding the, that birthday it kind of in a timeline and finally computing the the mean which is the youngest team well it's based it's basically the team that has the greatest to put in a way the 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 latest birth date right so 1922-03-14 is the um, latest date, birth date, mean birth, um, um, birth date, right? So if if we do something like, like let's let's put this in in timestamp dot now. Let's put this in in days, right? So Basically, or actually, let's put this in years. Uh, days, there you go. So, the average age, and of course, this is 2017. We can actually do that. We can say this to 2018-01-01. It's the same thing. This doesn't change anything. Uh, Timestamp there. So, the, the, the team Portland, for the Trailblazers... Trail Portland has the youngest squad by average, right? Because basically the average age was 25 uh, years, not days, because we're, we're dividing by 365. So 25 years was the average age of the Portland tra Trailblazers. And two concepts here I want to separate them. The first one, and sorry, the second one that I mentioned was that we are here finding the youngest team. That's basically the greatest date, right? If I was born in, I was born in 1987, my brother was born in 1992, he has a newer birth date, right? Most, more recent, but that makes him younger, right? I have a, an older date date a lower value right 1987 is lower than 1992 but that makes that makes me older that makes him younger right that's that's the second thing that i mentioned very quickly the first thing which is the most important one is that let's get rid of that is that the birth date column is a daytime and we correctly had a mean computed for that. Will be the alternative, and actually let's try the activity. That works. What is the, the um, alternative, and I think we have that listed in the solution, is let's say this didn't exist, we'll we basically need to transform the date back to a number. And we can say, let's say dates, um, we can say, age in days we have to transform this thing from a date to a number so we can say the f at age in days and we can say pd let's actually let me actually show you the the result first the f at um birth date um minus or actually the other way pd dot timestamp we said um dot now minus that, that gives you a time delta. That's the, the name of the value. Pandas time delta, I'm gonna, I'm Googling it real quick. And we can find a time delta, it's just 
a relative duration of time. Um, and that is the, to the time delta. And we can get, for example, to be very precise, we can get total seconds, right? Um, total seconds dt, total seconds. Or we can get something like days. And here, what I'm doing is a dt daytime accessor. So if a pandas series, a column in a data frame, is of time, if a, is a daytime or a time delta, it has a special accessor dot dt that lets you perform some daytime calculation on it. Similar as with, uh, for example, the f at team dot str, we have the str accessor for string columns. We have the dt accessor for uh, daytime and time delta columns or series. So anyway, we can say um, this thing, h in we probably will not say it. So we say, we say player, we say um, birth date, and we are going to say age in days, birth dates. There you go. So someone that was born in 1993-08-01, so August 1st, is 10,893 days old. So now we have transformed the daytime back into a numeric column. And we can now compute the, um, the average age. So we can say group by same thing, team at age in days, uh, dot min, sort values, and I did something wrong as usual, group. I don't know why I have so many issues with this group by the name. And now what you can see is that we actually have to think the result in an opposite direction. Now the lowest value is the youngest one. Of course, the previous one was the, the, the date, the most recent date gave us the youngest um, team, now the team with the lowest age in days is of course the youngest team. That's basically what we're finding right here. And we have, let me clear this whole thing so we can compare. Uh, birth date and this age in days, we have the same results ideally. Portland, try, let me actually sort it. Sort um, ascending false so we compare the values. And we have Portland Portland, Toronto, Toronto, Boston, Boston, Orlando, Orlando. So it's the same value for both. I think the interesting takeaway here is how Pandas implements all these useful daytime modifications, modifiers, methods, and even these operations. I think that's the most interesting piece so far. So again, wrapping it up, this project extremely interesting because we did pretty much the full cycle. We got the data, we merged it, we identified invalid values using this detective work, finding what happened, rewinding time. Uh, we did some Googling. We finally did some cleaning, transformed data types like birth date. Then we did um, all this, you know, munging of the data. There you go, deleting these totals, understanding the data we were working with. And finally, we did all this analysis. My favorite activity is by far the number 15 one with the transform method, extremely useful method. So if you want to replay it, just you know try to solve it by yourself. Um, and I think I think this project represents very well the whole process of data science, data wrangling, data munging, data engineering, everything you're gonna find in a in a regular project dealing with data.